Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C A C H E F L Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. The show originally aired on the Premier Networks on Sunday, April 3rd, 2016. This is episode 1276. Enjoy. The Tech Guy is brought to you by Score Big. Pay less for quality seats to your favorite sporting and music events. Go to scorebig.com, click the microphone, and enter the promo code Tech Guy to save $20 off your first ticket purchase. And by Wealthfront. Wealthfront is a low-cost, automated investment service and the most sophisticated way to invest your money, whether you've got millions or you're just starting out. Visit Wealthfront.com slash tech guy and sign up to get your free personalized investment portfolio. That's Wealthfront.com slash tech guy. And by Epson's new EcoTank printers. With Epson's line of SuperTank all-in-one printers, you can print thousands of documents without running out of ink. EcoTank is loaded and ready to print when you are. Visit Epson.com slash EcoTank to find out more. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Yay. Well, yay for me. You may not feel that way, but you may be going to the Home Improvement Show down the channel. But to, honestly, this is a great show because you want to you wanna know, don't you, about what's happening in the world of technology, of, of computers and the Internet and smartphones and you know, smart watches, you know, all that health band stuff, what the FBI's up to with iPhones, Facebook, Google. You want to know that? Amazon. This is what we talk about, our changing world. And the nice thing is there's no politics. There's no, nobody dies. It's kind of like the toy store, but it's the toy store where the toys actually make a difference and they're kind of important. So that's, that's why I like it. That's why I've been covering this beat for almost... I didn't want to say. <laughs> Since the late 70s. So it's almost 40 years. Actually, happy birthday to Apple Computer on April 1st, 1976. They incorporated. And that makes Apple 40 years old as of Friday. 40 years old. That's, you know, when you, when, when, then's when you know we got a mature industry, right? 40 years is a long time for a company. Google's, you know, what, 12, 13 years? I don't know. Somewhere around there. Microsoft, more than 40 years old. IBM, 100 years old. I don't know. They're, they're pretty old. Amazon, about 10, 15 years old. We're getting a, It's a mature industry. And as a result, as you can see, the products are mature. Apple had its big uh, event announcing uh, its new iPhone and iPad. And everybody went, oh, well, that's, that's nice. <laughs> the new iPhone, exactly like the old iPhone. I mean, the really old iPhone. It's got the iPhone 5 screen, 4-inch screen, with the guts of an iPhone 6S. Um, Apple, at this point, Apple is uh, nibbling around the edges. They're not going to make any major uh, big innovations. Now, on the other hand, there is a new kid in town. Actually, there's two new kids in town that those of us who have been around for a while are watching with great interest, thinking this might be the next big thing. You know, that's what we're always looking for. What's the next big thing? What's going to change life as we know it? And I think there are two, maybe three candidate technologies. I'll give you all three. Maybe four. I'll give you, actually, there are five. No. <laughs> I'll start. I'll start. You count. <laughs> we'll figure out what that number is. Uh, this week, uh, we got, and I set it up yesterday and played with it, our Oculus Rift. This was the virtual reality helmet. It's a visor you strap on. It covers your eyes completely. It's like a blindfold, except you've got two screens in front of your eyes and it has motion tracking it tracks your head it actually has a little camera that tracks your whole body so you put that on the table in front of you it also has headphones with really good quality sound and uh and it's a, so it's a virtual reality helmet and i played a few virtual reality games there's a, there'll be a, a variety of categories of content designed for this kind of gear uh, movies that are immersive you can look around look in front of you behind you so you'll be staring at george clooney behind you will be, uh, uh, I don't know, Amy McAdams. And then you'll look back and forth and to your left, Zach Galafinakis. Wow. Hey, Zach. 
and and they're all doing their thing, but you're right in the smack dab in the middle of it. And unlike the movies that we see today, you're the cameraman, you're the director, you get to choose what you look at. Intriguing. Nobody's really developing content for that yet, but that's that's intriguing. There's also another another category of content for these virtual reality headsets. Gaming, of course, and that's where it'll really explode. In fact, this year we expect not only the Oculus Rift, which is owned by Facebook, but HTC, the phone manufacturer, has made a, 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 a VR, apparently very good VR headset called the Vive, V-I-V-E, -E, in conjunction with Steam, which is a big uh, distributor of games on the PC. That'll be out later this year. It's available now for 800 bucks for pre-order. And then Sony for its PlayStation 4 also has a VR headset. So there's three coming out this year. Movies, games, and reality, sort of. I mean, that's one of the things Google's pushing with its uh, cardboard. Google Cardboard is a handheld visor, much much the same, without the sound. But it's So it's kind of like a Viewmaster in 3D, and you look around with that. Uh, Samsung has the Gear VR that you put your Samsung phone in. does the same thing. Again... Sound is is you know comes from the phone. You could put on headphones, of course. So uh, it's a little it's kind of in between cardboard and, and Oculus. Games, movies, reality content. The idea that you know Samsung pushed this. Your friends are in Paris. You're at home. Oh, I miss my friends. They turn on their Samsung 360 degree camera. Samsung is selling such a thing, and suddenly you're there with them. Hey Joey. Hey Sally. How you doing? How you doing? And you're walking down the Champs Elysees, and they say, "Hey, wait a minute! Look, there's the Arc de Triomphe." And you go, "Oh, wait, what? Oh, wow!" And you walk under, and you're with them. So that's another experience: live, immersive reality. And all these are doable right now. I played a number of games yesterday and was kind of blown away. I played a simple, silly little, almost a kid's game. They call them platformers. You know, you're jumping, jumping, jumping bouncing on mushrooms and things like that. What's it called? Lucky's Tale, I think. Now, at first I poo-pooed it. I thought, well, <laughs> that's dopey. Who wants to play that? Oh, you want to play it. Because suddenly you're inside a cartoon universe. You're in it. And it's three-dimensional. And it's vivid. And you can look up and down and around. And it's very compelling. You use a game controller, an Xbox-style game controller. Actually, it is an Xbox controller. And play this, and it was awesome. Now, of course, you have to have an expensive computer to play this. It requires a Windows 10 PC with pretty high-end accoutrement. We spent several thousand dollars on the one we built just for this purpose. But, man, you get the right PC and the right headgear and the right games, and a few thousand dollars later, you're playing a kid's game and going, whoa, whoa. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. It, I mean, I'm not. It's hard to describe, but uh, the look of joy. If you if you ever see anybody playing these on people's faces, is wow. There's a dinosaur right there, and I can almost touch it. That's what's a little frustrating. You can't you can't touch it. You can almost touch it. Uh, what you can do is uh, reach out, <laughs> duck, bob, and weave. But until they release the little handles, they have two handles that they're going to put in your hand. Then you'll be able to literally reach your hand out and touch it. I can't wait to play Minecraft with this. And I'm sure I will soon. So that's one. That's technology number one that I think it could potentially be revolutionary. Kind of a sidecar to this is, is not virtual reality, but augmented reality. Microsoft this week showed off more of their HoloLens and started shipping it to developers. HoloLens is the same idea. It's a visor, but it's a visor you see through. They're like sunglasses. So you see the real world and superimposed on the real world is stuff. And this is probably more useful. It might even be the future of user interfaces. You look to your left, there's your menus. You look to your right, there's your folders. Your files are in front of you. It's very compelling. Yeah, and you might say a little isolating. What are some of the other technologies? Well, <laughs> uh, the big talk at Microsoft's Build Conference was bots and messaging. And I think messaging is the next... Bots are apps. Messaging is the operating system, if you, th if you think of it that way. And you know how the app economy with Apple's iPhone in 2007 changed everything? Well, a bot economy is going to do something similar, I think, to mobile platforms with messaging. The third technology, still a ways off, going to be interesting, autonomous vehicles. I'm telling you, in 10 years, you'll look back and you'll say, wow, didn't see this coming. Or maybe I did. Leo did. You're not going to be driving anymore. 
I know that sounds hard to believe, but I, f I fully believe this is imminent. The technology is there. And then, you know, some side technologies that I think are very interesting. Amazon's Echo, for instance, we've talked a lot about that. That's the little tube in your house that you talk to and it talks back to you. That's kind of like another messaging platform, though. I think of that as, and the bots are the apps for Amazon Echo. I think of that as kind of hand in hand. We, there, Believe me, we ain't done with this technology revolution yet. Just because PCs and smartphones and tablets are kind of mature doesn't mean there's something there's not something new just around the corner and that's what we cover on this show my phone number 8888 ask leo if you want to talk about it let's do it right after this once again i've brought with me my delicious salad in a jar man i wish i'd invented that so we got a little onion or shallot perhaps i think i like shallots cucumbers green peppers red tomatoes might be some yellow peppers in there as well. On top of that, some garbanzo beans, some luscious quinoa, some shredded cabbage, broccoli, and carrots. And on uh, top of that, some spinach. And on top of that, a tangy dressing of my own design. Luscious quinoa. I love quinoa. <laughs> oh, honey, you haven't had quinoa, some, do you? had my quinoa. Some people can't even say it right. Oh, they you haven't. It's quinoa. It's quinoa. <laughs> they don't Q even know what it is. Q-U-I-N-O-A. It's, it's a South American seed. It's very high in protein. It is a carb, but it's got a low glycemic index, and it's very high in protein. And the way I make it, you're going to like it, because I don't use water. You make it kind of like rice. I use chicken broth. And it is... I don't give it more flavor. I'm telling you, you're going to... Yeah, flavor is the problem with quinoa. It's like rice. It has yeah, no flavor. Like but tofu. <laughs> or tofu. But if, if but prepared properly. Right. When you have this, you're going to say, you're gonna, you're, your whole world will change just as it does with Oculus Rift. you got to go try that, by the way. Thank okay. you, John. Absolutely. you got to go try that. But no, no, that's good. And then I make this dressing that is white balsamic... Um, a nice seedy mustard, <laughs> moutard de mo, a ton of shallots, which makes it very tangy, and it is it is a very potent. You take a taste of it, you go, oh wow! But Girl. when you mix, it, yeah, you have to flavor this stuff. And then, of course, at, when I get closer to lunch, I'll shake this up. <laughs> I gotta. I'm telling you, there's a blog post in here. I gotta write <laughs> someday. But if you go to Pinterest, you'll find a, quite a few of them. Somebody says, tofu has a taste. Beatmaster says, the taste of disappointment. <laughs> the taste of my tears. All right. We'll stop the show a little bit for you, uh, Robert, and uh, go make yourself some lunch, and we'll be back. <laughs> he says, I'm starving. Uh, the tether on the Oculus is about six feet. You don't. You're not supposed to move around too much. The idea is you can move kind of a little. <laughs> you would rubbling. You would love this. I could have a roadside stand selling these, and it'd be huge. I'm telling you. Look at that. Doesn't that look good? Kind of does. It's festive. Uh, I'd want some cheese in there somewhere. <laughs> no cheese would ruin it. I love cheese. I love cheese, too. You could put, okay, I'll let you put a little uh, grated parm in there. Something, a dry cheese. You don't want a gooey yeah. cheese. But a little grated parm, some Asiago, perhaps. Yeah. A little Romano. I just need a little bit. Some Manchego. A little grated up Manchego would be good in there. But no, there's no animal, there's no animal products of any, this is Except a vegan. Except for the chicken broth. Oh, chicken broth, you're right, it's not vegan, it's vegetarian, yeah, you're right. See. Not even no, really not vegetarian. Even vegetarian. <laughs> okay, so there, but I'm not a vegetarian, I'll eat chicken broth. Uh, I just buy chicken broth in the store, I don't make a chicken with it. I, I can easily make my own chicken broth, obviously, but the uh, we have some very good, um, Imagine makes a very nice chicken broth. You can buy in a little box. This is so much better than Easter candy. And, you know, afterwards you feel so much better than, than, Easter, candy. <laughs> than Easter candy. That is not a the good Easter feeling. Easter mimosas weren't bad. Oh, mm-hmm. <laughs> Leo Laporte, the tech guy. It is a call-in show, and I welcome your calls at 
Ask Leo. 888-827-5536. It's toll-free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. Outside those areas, you can call uh, via Skype. It still won't cost you anything if you're listening on the Internet, as many of you do, I know. Website is techguylabs.com. Tech guy, that's me. Labs, imagine me in a lab coat with goggles on. It's actually what I'm wearing right now. And, uh, and I'm in the labs with my Bunsen burners and my beakers, mixing up a heady stew of technology news TechGuyLabs.com. And you might say, well, Leo, that's fine, but I know you. You're going to charge me, aren't you? You're going to... No, 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 it's free. Oh, well, then you're going to make me sign up for some Fakatka newsletter, aren't you? No, I don't even have a newsletter. I don't want your email address. You just go there. You, it's, it's unheard of. It's a website you wander into. You click things and nothing happens. It's just pages come up. Information flows. Although, I, 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 there's a little tax I'd like to charge you. If you have an opinion or a comment or a suggestion... Please use the comment boxes. What we do is we divide the page up into uh, days, you know, episodes of the show, uh, hour by hour within that episode, and within those hours, question by question. So you can go right to that question. After the show, we put audio and video there. So if you miss the show, you could still hear or see what the, how, you know what happened. Uh, of course, text too, so you can read my the question and my answer. But then, and I know this is I know this happens because I do it too. I know some of you are sitting there when I answer questions going, Leo, you're wrong, and yelling at the radio. Leo, I have a better way. Well, you know, you don't need to yell at the radio anymore. In fact, you don't need to write anything down. It's all there. And if you have an addition, I would more than welcome it. A correction, anything. Please put it in the comments. Each question has its comment section. And that way, I think over time, we get to this really rich uh, site full of answers, uh, all kinds of answers. So that's uh, techguylabs.com, the only thing you have to remember. <sighs> now, Kim Schaffer is here. She's answering the phones. Great to see you, Kim. Good to see you, too. I understand you stayed up late playing cards against humanity last it's night. It's so much fun. It's so very wrong, too. You know, it's, a, it's an analog game. It's a card game, but it is kind of the darling of the geek set, isn't it? You know, have a few glasses of champagne, sit down on a couch with a bunch of strangers, and <laughs> it's and it's, play a, the game. it's a it's a it's a party about game. Reading the personalities of the people that you're playing with too. So it, it's an adult version of apples to apples. If right. you've ever played that, where you kind of come up with answers to uh, open ended questions, and then uh, you judge them. Right? You you pick the answer you right. think is the right answer. There's a question, and everybody gets to choose an answer, and that person gets to choose the right choose answer. Which one they but is the, best. the twist here is the questions are twisted and the answers are even more twisted. They're, they're very, very wrong. <laughs> Highly inappropriate, politically I, incorrect, something like I that. I got an ab workout from laughing mm -hmm. so much last night because it was just ridiculous. It's very adult. Don't play it with the kids. No, don't. <laughs> but, it's, but it is really fun. But and there is, you know, there are um, digital versions of this you can play on the phone. In fact, I've played games like this on the TV with Apple TV or Android TV. So instead of having a deck of cards, you and your friends can sit around the TV and it does all the kind of the busy work oh, okay. of shuffling and dealing and all that. Puts the question up in a big on the screen in a big way. And it's fun. <laughs> Yeah. We, we went through the entire box. We finished the game. And then so, apparently they have expansion packs. Yeah, many. Which I didn't know about. But the host was like, oh, they're under the table. No. Right now. It's morning. We got to go. <laughs> no. Yeah, great. It's a great icebreaker. A lot of fun. Yeah. Well, thank you for uh, showing up anyway. <laughs> I didn't sleep at all. so I What? Had, I Not had, at all? No. I, I Oh, too. Kim. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, can we make up a little bed for Kim under the desk <laughs> and she could take naps? It's a day today. <laughs> okay. What, uh, what, who should I start with? How about Brooke in Woodland Hills? Um, she needs help with her iPhone okay. stuff. She lost. Maybe uh -oh. help. <laughs> Call the FBI. Yeah. They seem to have a way in. know how to get it. Hey, Kim, how are you? I mean, oh, Brooke, Brooke, I'm sorry. Hi, Brooke. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. Hi. Hey, what happened? Well, um, I accidentally deleted um, my note off of my iPhone 5C. With, I just, like, split my hand and it just deleted the note. Aye, aye, aye. And it was for my homework. And then I went on Apple and I restored, I mean, I went on um, iTunes and I restored my phone. And it just deleted, like, everything. And I just don't. The whole phone? It. You just deleted everything because you restored from an old backup and it erased everything, right? Yeah, like my contacts, my notes, most of my photos. Okay. 
It was Apple Notes that you were using? It was the Apple Notes program? Yeah. Yeah. So here's, before, it may be too late, but the first thing you should do now is turn your phone off, 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 okay? Okay. So it doesn't back up. Were you backing up to the iCloud? I hope I crossed my fingers. Um, most of the stuff was, except when I tried to put my notes in the backup for iCloud, it just kept turning it off. Like when I turned it on, it would just go off. Well, turn off your phone so it'll stop, and then go log into your iCloud account at iCloud.com. Okay. Notes are backed up there unless you turn it off. So, I mean, this is, I don't want to give you too much hope because uh, <laughs> this is something you do right away, you know, because it's always backing up, isn't it? So it might be too late, but cross your fingers, maybe this is the only place it might be. Now, you when you restored from iTunes, you restored the latest backup, didn't you? Right? I think so. Because it, yeah. it, sorts, it sorts them by date. And um, so there's no more recent backup, which would be the thing you would want if you could to, uh, to see if you, it had saved the notes. But it sounds like you did that and that the notes yeah. weren't and the notes weren't there. Yeah. Um, just, I just wish there was like a way to like undo the backup. <laughs> yeah, there's no way undo the, to go back to the previous. Um, yeah, I, you know, it depends on how you set it. So here's my recommendation for future reference is uh, it's a great idea to back up to iTunes with a cable because that's fast. And you can turn on encrypted backup. You'll see there's a checkbox and enter a password. And if you do that, it will save your passwords and stuff like your uh, Wi-Fi logins and stuff. And that's that's convenient. So and encryption means that it's private. The backup is private, which is a good idea because you don't want anybody to see your backups. Including, right. including Apple. Yeah. So uh, I do I do use iCloud backup um, via, via iTunes. Actually, it's not iCloud. It's iTunes backup, and I do encrypt that. I would also turn on... The problem with iCloud backup is for free, you only get five gigabytes. That's not enough even to back up your whole phone if you have a, a lot of stuff. Yeah, on it. I just... I actually have another question, like, with that, and it's pretty quick. But um, I just... Um, updated it it to like 50 gigabytes of data Good. yes for a couple that's only three bucks a month or something yeah or yeah, so, yeah. 99 cents. Yeah. but now it, it says um total storage i mean available total storage it's like 43.3 but my phone keeps saying that it's like the storage is almost full i don't know I don't want to well make sure you're on that same icloud account right yeah i am um and it may be Hmm, that's interesting. And maybe the phone just hasn't uh, gotten message, gotten the word from Apple that there's more storage there. So give it a little bit of time. They should roughly match. It may not be full 50 because there's, there's other stuff. Boy, that's about all I can tell you. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. See, so your notes are backed up right there on the iCloud. Yeah. Uh, that's a problem. Somebody asked me, how did you see Hamilton? How did you do that? How did you get to see Hamilton? It's called money. <laughs> I went to score big. <laughs> Does it might be less money than you think. You know, it turns out about 40% of all live event tickets are unsold. Um, not Hamilton <laughs> so much. But there's a lot of ball games. Like, isn't aren't the isn't the baseball home openers there this weekend? This week, rather, yeah. right? Maybe you'd like to go, and you think, oh, I can't possibly be able to go to that. It's probably all sold out. You know what? Guess what? It's often not. So the first place I go when I'm looking for tickets is ScoreBig.com. ScoreBig. So if you're a big, I don't want to, I don't want to name names. But let's say you're a big singing sensation, platinum artist, and you're you got a stadium concert with thirty thousand seats, and they don't all sell. You're not going to go out and make put an ad saying, "Hey, there's plenty of seats left." You're not going to do that. <laughs> you're going to pretend it's sold out. And then what you do is you go to Scorebig, and this is what they do: they go to Scorebig, and they say, "Hey, we got ten thousand seats." That means you can go to Scorebig and pay much less than box office, much less than the face value for tickets. 
Visit scorebig.com. You find the events you want, the seat you want, and then you make an offer with their name a ticket price feature. You'll get an answer instantly, and you can save up to 60%. These are big-name artists that often don't sell out because these are big, they're big venues. Or maybe the artist isn't as big as they thought they were. Maybe you love them, but no one else does. I don't know. You'll also have the option to pay a fixed price, still less expensive than the other online ticket resellers. And here's the thing, and it's very important that you know this because those other resellers trick you. They give you a price, and then at the end at checkout, they say, oh, no, here's our service fee. <laughs> Not Scorebig. With Scorebig, there are no surprise fees. Shipping is free. So you're getting quoted the total price. There's no surprise at the end. I really like I appreciate that. You can even favorite shows and events to be notified. So you can say, ah, let me know if there's any tickets available for Hamilton. That's a great feature. So stop overpaying for tickets. Get the tickets you want at prices you can afford with Score Big. This is, this is the place that the venues go to when they haven't sold out to secretly sell the rest of those tickets. And that's why you can save up to 60%. The next time you're planning to attend a game or a show, before you go anywhere else, go to Score Big and see... Check it out. Go to scorebig.com. Click the microphone. we got a special deal for you. Sign up right now. Have $20 off your first order and exclusive deals sent you your box. But don't forget the promo code. That's the most important part. Tech guy. Tech guy. And we thank Scorebig for supporting the Tech Guy podcast. It's our advertisers that make that, that difference, that make it possible for us to give it to you for free. It is really awesome. In fact... Lisa and I were saying, you know, the Giants opener's coming up. We really ought to get tickets. Too late, right? Not necessarily. I got, I know a guy who knows a guy. Scorebig.com. Don't forget your offer code. Tech guy. Giants Dodgers, April 7th. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Back to the phones. We go. Marty is in Newton, Mass. Hey, Marty. Hi, how are you, Leo? I'm great. How you doing? I'm doing great. Good. What's up? Not much. Well, <laughs> well, I hope you yeah. call me for something. But if you want, we could just shoot the breeze. I mean, I don't know. I'd like to do a Leo Laporte brain dump. Ah, uh -huh. that could that could t either take a long that time or not work. long at all, depending on the subject matter. <laughs> 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 what would you like to know about? Oh, well, I'd like to know many things. But um, I'm a uh, one. I, I've uh, my one of my hobbies is ham radio. And awesome. Are you a ham? I am a ham. Uh, fantastic. What's your call sign? You got to remember, if you're a ham, you have to spit it out right away. Yeah, KC1CWF. KC1CWF. This is W6TWT. Okay, maybe we'll hear you on the air. Never. In a few you years. You know why? In a few years. When I retire, you know why I realized I got the license and everything. It was e It's fun, by the way. It's easy. I got all the equipment. <laughs> Thanks to ICOM, they set me up with a lot of gear. And then I realized, wait a minute, I talk on the air all day, every day. The last thing I want to do is go home and talk some more. So when I retire, you know, Art Bell, who's, of course, a great radio host, is also a great ham. And he does that. He will, the show will end, and Art will go into his shack and keep going. <laughs> wow. That is a guy who likes yeah. to talk. I, I've, I'm pretty much talked out by the end of the day. <laughs> my, my wife used to say, you know... If there's, you won't even open your mouth if there's not more than a thousand people listening. It's kind of true. <laughs> so, so what? So good. Congratulations. I think ham is a great thing, especially for young people to do because it's a great yeah. way to learn about electronics. Uh, and nowadays, ham is very much a digital technology. So you, it is. it's a great way to learn. That brings me to my question for you. Yes. Um, in my radio shack, I have a computer. Obviously, uh, most people do. I think these nowadays, days. yeah. Why not? Um. So. I have it all set up and working. Uh, yeah. I went through the, uh, the the great pain of configuring a uh, serial port to make it work with my radios and whatnot. Yeah, and, that's uh, you know it's unfortunate because the computer technology somewhat outpaced the ham gear, and you know the idea of an RS two thirty two port is long gone in the days of computing. Many a lot of the newer ham gear is USB. Thank goodness. I think still many, many new radios are coming out with, with serial ports. I know, with RS-232 anyways, ports. I uh, set up my radio to, to work remotely over the Internet. Good. And uh, I, uh, it was working great. Can I ask how old um, you are? Uh, 14. That's so awesome. 
And you uh, know, famous uh, hams, Steve Wozniak, the founder of Apple. He was a ham. There are great many of. Yeah, I don't know if he's ever on the air, but he's still a ham. He still has his call sign. Uh -huh. uh, you know, once a ham, always a ham. Amateur radio operators never fit. They don't. Yeah. They don't die. Their signal just fades. Yes. <laughs> but uh, anyways, um, it was working great. Um, I, I was. I used it on the mega bus last night on my way home from New York. Wow, that's yeah. cool. And I got. So you have a, a portable uh, uh, handy talkie. Yeah, this is HF. Oh, it's HF. Wow. Yeah. How do you do that on a bus? So I. Uh, Creativity. There's <laughs> there's radios and interfaces that you can pay thousands of dollars, but I don't own, I don't even own a thousand dollars of radio gear. No, you don't so need I to have, anymore. Uh, That's the beauty of it. I found a software that lets me emulate the uh, front panel of the radio on the computer. Nice. Um, so you so did it on your laptop with Wi-Fi. Yeah, so you, awesome. so I, I use TeamViewer to use uh, my desktop of my radio computer. Nice. So that I can control the radio, and I wrote some software to switch all my antennas, and then I just use TeamViewer to pass audio. Wow, you are yeah, so, you are a geek. Now, see, this is I, a good I example. Everything with TeamViewer. So you've uh, become a, you've become a computer expert and an amateur radio expert to to do this, and that's, uh, that's I wouldn't awesome. use the word expert. But. Well, you might be more expert than you think. I mean, I think <laughs> what you just said went whoosh, right over the head of most of the people listening. So that's a good sign. <laughs> anyway, so it was working great. I came back last night. I uh, I walked out of the room. I just see if the computer was on and whatnot because I've been using it remotely for so many days. It was working fine. I walked back in, and uh, it was off. Couldn't turn it on. And uh, you could hear the screen when it lights. Uh, you could hear the hard drive start to turn for a second. You'd hear a fan, it would shut off. Uh-oh. So I said, whatever. It wasn't, it wasn't that nice of a computer. I pulled the hard drive. I have all my files. So you don't mind losing the because Because it's probably just the power supply, I would almost certainly guess. Yes. And that's not an expensive um, thing to replace. Just don't open the no, power but the supply. Computer's no more, the computer is no more. It was a very cheap computer. All right, good. And I'm looking to upgrade anyways. This is, you so know this what? This is my question. This is you. when you you see a, a smile on the face of somebody whose computer just died. They've been wanting a new one for a while. And finally, <laughs> finally, and the old computer excuse. became a silent key. And now, now, thank God, I can get a new one. So what yeah. do you want to know? So my question for you is, uh, and the, the the software I run for ham radio is the equivalent of, uh, of word processing, et cetera. Right. So I don't need much power, and I just quite frankly don't want to spend much money. How much are you? How much are you? How much? What's your budget? I mean, but budget is what it needs to be. Okay. But, uh, but you got a I keyboard, don't. a mouse, and a monitor. So really, all you want to do is re you replace the middle part. Here's what I would recommend. And I think a lot of hams use these. Intel has a thing called a NUC. <laughs> Terrible name, NUC. It's the new unit of computing, which makes it a doubly terrible name because not only is it a bad acronym, it's a bad acronym for a terrible phrase. What the heck is that, a new unit of computing? The NUCs, though, are little devices. They're really, you know, to be honest, the Apple invented this with the, the Mac Mini. They're the size, it's hard, to, how do I describe it, of a hot plate or smaller, really. Uh, although that is an apt description, since they can get a little warm, probably not enough to uh, brew coffee, but certainly enough to keep the mug hot. They have on them everything you need, and they're very inexpensive, uh, especially since you already have the keyboard, mouse, and monitor. You're just going to buy a little NUC. It's nice, doesn't take up much space in the ham shack. And you plug in everything you need, and absolutely be great for ham. In fact, I know people who take these NUCs, they're so small, and they affix them with Velcro or some other uh, attachment to the back of the monitor, and then you don't even see the computer. You can get NUCs in a huge range of prices because that will very much depend on how much memory, how much processor, and so forth. So you can get them with everything from an i3 to an i7 in there. I think they even make them with, with Atom processors. RAM is typically 2 to 4 gigabytes, but you know you can do more or less depending on what you want. Um, so the range of capabilities is great. You could look at a, a, a plain board or you could look at a, a, a bare bones kit, which will have everything you need in it. Amazon sells them. Newegg sells them. And there are even third-party manufacturers now who are making NUX. I am actually quite a fan of a NUX, of the NUX. So if you go to uh, Amazon or Newegg.com and just search for NUC, you'll see the range from 300 to 500 actually there's some for 174 bucks so you can re really at this point you can say well here's my budget 
let's get the let's get the most nuck I can. Look, there's one for $127. That's a, amazing. Now, what is in there? Not much. Uh, the processor is uh, is a Celeron. That's not. But you know, for for if for a lot of the stuff you're doing, you don't need. You're not you're not doing playing a game on this thing. You're just doing your ham stuff. Uh, you need to add a hard drive. It doesn't come with a hard drive in this case. That's one thing to be aware of. Some of these NUC kits don't come with all the parts you need. Nevertheless, 127 bucks. you add a hard drive, you're still well under 200 bucks. 8880, enjoy your ham. <laughs> Would you like some cheese with that ham? W6TWT73, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More of your calls coming up right after this. I have an Intel compute stick. That even might be enough. He said, getting his man purse out. Why, I seem to have one right here. <laughs> so this is this is kind of crazy. Now, these are not super powerful. I'm not sure I'd recommend these. Um, but if you have an HDMI monitor, which includes most TVs nowadays, right? Uh, this is a very low-end... PC. This was 80 bucks because it runs Linux. A little bit more money if you want Windows 10 on this thing. And um, it has this USB port is for power. So it does require power. And it comes with a 10 watt power adapter. So it's it's maybe enough to power it with your TV. Kind of depends because many TVs have USB ports. That's a USB port you can use for your keyboard, mouse, or monitor. All uh, uh, Keyboard or mouse. Rather, uh, but I do believe there's Bluetooth in here. Extra storage via micro SD. That's cool, right? So that's 80 some bucks, almost 90, I think. But there's also, um, <laughs> this was our pick of the week last week for the show. I mean, that's pretty amazing. That's a whole computer in there running uh, uh, Ubuntu. Uh, and then somebody said, why don't you mention the Raspberry Pi? And sure, you could run a Raspberry Pi, $35. It may be enough, frankly. Uh, I love the Raspberry Pi. So I'll mention that when I come back. Um, the, the Raspberry Pi's default operating system is Raspbian, which is a vers version of Debian designed for it. But, you, but Microsoft does offer Windows 10, the Internet of Things version, which maybe, you know, that's the problem is the software. Maybe it can, maybe it can't run the software. Um, the Raspberry Pi 3 is, is a pretty, ca it's probably as capable as this. But this has a full Windows 10 on it, or if, as opposed to the IoT version of Windows 10. Hmm. Yeah, I wouldn't. <laughs> I have a $70 Windows tablet. I'm not sure I'd recommend that. <laughs> Partly because you can't really update it. <laughs> uh, Project Cars is now downloaded. Uh, it was 20 gigs, so we weren't able to download it before I left last night, but it is downloaded. I've just re imaged the drive so we have everything on there, and we're going to get uh, Ms. Schaffer on that Oculus Rift. Although, you're probably so punchy that. <laughs> I heard I might puke. <laughs> you know, it it did not um, it did not do as much of that as previous versions. <laughs> okay. I have I've gotten very nauseous on Oculus Rift, but mostly you get that when your your character is moving a lot and you're not, and your body goes, "What the hell's going on?" My inner ear's saying, "I'm you know oh, right. upright," but my eyes are telling me the opposite. So um, I don't think that this is nearly as bad. Um, and you're not moving much. You're moving a little bit like this. Although your character, in the case of the Lucky game, you're, you're kind of flipping around. I got a little queasy with that one. So, there's, so they actually rate games by comfort. Okay. Yeah. So, so you can play stuff that's more comfortable if you're getting queasy. I well, think you get used to I'm it. I'm good with roller coasters and being flipped upside down and everything. Will that help? <laughs> oh, yeah. That will help. I've never had any problems. Do you get car it. sick? No. Oh, well, you're not going to get queasy. I don't, uh, you know, I took the ferry for years. And oh, no, no. You'll be yeah, fine then. No, no, no. It's yeah, only people who will get car sick and seasick easily. Yeah. yeah okay. If you like roller coasters, yeah. I don't think you'll have the problem. Lisa claims that they may all make her queasy, and she tried this, and she said it didn't make her queasy. Okay. Uh, it's pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. It's pretty awesome. I want to watch you do it, though. 
That thing that you had in here the other day was pretty cool, too, that Alex brought with all the different cameras. Yeah, the Ozo. Yeah. Yeah, that's for making this stuff. Yeah. Is that what that's for? Yeah, that's for that's for shooting the video that you would then wear the, the you know, do the VR thing to see. Oh. That's like Google Street View. Yeah, on that's what it is, kind of. Yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> Minus the LiDAR. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 88, 88. Ask Leo. You know, somebody in the chat room said, why didn't you tell Marty about the Raspberry Pi? And actually, there's a whole category of computers, not just the Raspberry Pi, uh, the Intel Compute Stick. These are all sub-$100 computers. The Raspberry Pi is $35. The Intel Compute Stick ranges from $100 to $110, depending on whether you want Linux or Windows on it. These are... These are so I mentioned the NUC, which is the size of a hot plate. <laughs> These are uh, the size of a USB key or uh, a matchbox. Actually, the uh, the Raspberry Pi is about the size of an Altoids tin, a mint, tin of mints. And in fact, people have made cases for it with Altoids tins. It's just right. <laughs> Fits perfectly. So I really like the Raspberry Pi. And I would encourage parents who have precocious, intelligent kids from, say, 12 years and up, Maybe younger, if they're really smart, 10 years even. I would encourage them. You know, the kid by now is saying, can, my, can I have my, I want a computer. I need a computer. You got to get me a computer. And it's fine, you know, for them to have, I would say a, a Chromebook would be a great start for uh, m most kids starting from about fourth grade on. But uh, if the kid really shows some aptitude for technology, some interest in technology, maybe you're thinking he wants to know more about programming. If your child, here's a, here's a test. If your child plays Minecraft to the point of not eating, <laughs> which, which is most 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds these days, let me recommend a Raspberry Pi. First of all, 35 bucks. You can go to Adafruit, A-D-A-F-R-U-I-T.com and get one. for. Th they have kits that will give you more stuff like a case because it doesn't come with a case. It's just a bare board. But it's an interesting bare board because for 35 bucks, it has four USB ports. It has an Ethernet jack. It has a it has a HDMI port. So all you really need is a keyboard, mouse, and, uh, and an HDMI-capable monitor, which could be an old TV. And you've got a full computing system. It, it For storage, it uses a micro SD card. So you'll need one of those as well. And it's easiest to take your regular computer and put the operating system on the micro SD card before you get the Raspberry Pi. Uh, if you buy it from Adafruit, you can buy it with an SD card that's preloaded with noobs, <laughs> which is the uh, out-of-the-box system software for the Raspberry Pi. So they, you put the little noobs S micro SD. It's the size of a cornflake in, in, the, in the thing. And you connect it up to your TV via an HDMI cable. You have to have one of those, too. Again, this you see why a kit kind of gets valuable. It'd be nice to have a little plexiglass box to put it in or an Altoids tin or something. Don't use an Altoids tin unless you know what you're doing because it's metal. It could conduct and you could fry the whole thing. Plastic would be better. Put it in a plastic box. Um, plug in a mouse and a keyboard. It doesn't do Wi-Fi unless you get the newest Raspberry Pi 3. That has Wi-Fi built in. Otherwise, you'll get a little USB Wi-Fi stick. Or better yet, connect it to Ethernet if you're near the router. And now, and I think this is something you could say to the kid, here, here, kid, <laughs> take this in your room and figure it out. And if and if a child is smart, and I think I think most most technically literate kids could probably figure out enough to go on the internet, read up on what they need. Maybe they'll come back to you and say, Mom, I need 15 bucks for a, uh, a cable or something like that. Now, what's cool is if they put the default operating system, which is a Unix-based, a Linux-based operating system called Raspbian on there, it comes with Minecraft. Tell them this. Oh, here's your new Minecraft computer, and here's the cool thing. Not only does it come with Minecraft, but it comes with the ability to program Minecraft, to write computer code for it in a language called Python, which is a great learning language widely used by NASA, Google, and others. It's a great language. I mean, it's a professional language as well as being a great learning language. And so it won't be long before the kid figures out not only can, can she play Minecraft on it, but she can also easily write a little bit of code that will maybe build a pyramid or a house or a castle or move one of the other players uh, out of the, her area or all sorts of things. And suddenly they have incentive and a, and a kind of a sandbox to play and learn how to code. 
I, I interviewed the author of a great book, a book I found online called uh, How to, what is it, a Programming Minecraft in, four, in uh, Python, something like that. It's from No Starch Press. Craig Richardson is the author. You might slip that in, you know, into their book bag, too. <laughs> you know, you don't want to, as a parent, you don't want to look like you're pushing them, like, oh, this would be good for you. You know, you can't say, oh, you know, this would be, this is good for you. You know, you just say, don't, whatever you do, don't play with that. Don't play Minecraft on that Raspberry Pi. Whatever you do, that's for homework. <laughs> and then you slip the book in their book bag. And, uh, you know, three years later, she'll come out of her room and she'll get a job at Google. And, you know, you don't have to worry about retirement. It's that simple. Really amazing. This is an amazing computer. Created as an educational computer, actually, by the Raspberry Pi Foundation, Eben Upton and Company. And it's just a neat idea. So Raspberry Pi. Go to Adafruit. Get a kit if you want. You know, it comes with cables and breadboards and stuff. You can do things. Or, or let the kid figure it out. <laughs> just slip them a book or a website. Peter in Cleveland, Ohio. Hello, Peter. Leo Laporte. The hey, tech Leo. Guy. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Good, good. I'm a big fan of your podcast. Thank you. So I've got a question about my parents' house. They're in their 70s. They get their Internet through a large international company that's three letters. It begins with an A. <laughs> and it's terrible. Oh. They live in a fairly, like in the country, and... Every few hours, it drops for maybe three to five minutes. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I had the tech out here at Christmas time the last time I was... Is it, let me there. ask you, is it coming, yeah. through the, it's coming through the phone line? Yes. So it may not be completely that company's fault. Right. This as, is what the tech explained. As you know. He so, replaced the router. He went outside and looked at a couple of the telephone poles outside and said, these lines are 60 years old. That's the problem. Least, and... This is what you get. So DSL, which is a technology that brings you Internet over the phone lines, was created by the phone companies. In the earliest days, they thought they were going to do cable. They thought they were going to put TV over it. They called it uh, uh, Internet Dial Tone or something. It stands for Digital Subscriber Line. Uh, but it has some real uh, flaws. For one thing, it's dependent on the two copper wires coming to your house from the phone company. If you're... In a rural area, you're far from the central office, it will slow down, may not even work. If the wires inside the house or outside the house are old, 60 years old, it will work or not work or work yeah. sporadically. And the weather, the change of season. Everything can affect yeah. it, yeah. And the problem is you're going through, I presume, a company that, is it AT&T? Yeah. Well, they own those wires. <laughs> so you can demand, you, but they may not respond, but... See, a lot of times you get DSL from a third party that doesn't own the wires. Then you're really, what are you going to do? They have to, the third party has to go to the phone company and say fix it. But you're getting it from your phone company. Right. So they really ought to fix it. But as you can see, they're not that incented to do so. It's no, down closer to the city, you know, they've upgraded a whole neighborhood. Sure, but you're too, it, your parents are too rural. Right. In fact, that's amazing they can get it. So this is one reason. We, uh, it, greatest country in the world, the worst internet. I agree. I in the world, the it costs world more. We get less so quality, and that's because we invented it. Yeah. And then the FCC did a really dumb thing; they allowed the cable companies and the phone companies to have a duopoly, so there's no competition. Right. So essentially, your other choice is cable, maybe right. satellite. Well, they have they have a direct TV. Is how they watch TV. Satellite. Okay. I'm, we're gonna have to break for news at the top of the hour. Hang on the line. I'll talk yeah. to you off the air, but. Satellite might work, but it costs a lot, and it has some downsides. It's latent. It can be slow. There's caps on bandwidth. However, for rural people, maybe the best. We'll talk. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I think we know what I've been saying right. already, right. the and DSL. on your podcast, and, but, you know, no, they don't really notice. It's when I come here and oh. use my laptop, so <laughs> well, like, wow, I, I can't download this. If mom and dad don't this. care, don't make them pay hundreds of dollars to get a satellite right. dish. <laughs> the only time mom really notices is when she goes to print a document, yeah. and it's a wireless printer, well, you know, Epson wireless printer. It doesn't print right away. She pushes it three times, and then it prints out three... Three copies, five That minutes. is not DSL's problem. So you don't have to use their Wi-Fi router. In fact, I would right. I would recommend that you just turn off the Wi-Fi capabilities in the router AT&T gave you. 
right? And buy a and this might help a lot and buy a decent wireless Wi-Fi router for your parents. Okay. Okay, that's um, something I never considered. Yeah, yeah. And get, get, I like the ASUS um, okay. lines. Um, they make excellent Wi-Fi routers that are very good quality. That's, see, the printing inside the house doesn't have anything to do with DSL. That's just going through your local network. Admittedly, the Wi-Fi router that AT&T gave but you probably But if the Wi-Fi is, is shut off from AT&T, mom's connection to the w printer is lost. Isn't that true? No. No. Okay. No, the internal network is independent of the Internet. I see. So my suggestion would be um, get a good. In she's got a. They, you know they give you junky hardware because they don't. You know they don't care. And the worst, they right. rent it to you, <laughs> which is really annoying. I, so I'm gonna, I'll see when they're not home right now. But when they get back into town, I'm going to redo their whole system. Yeah, just put a better wireless router in there. You'll have to turn off the wireless router capability on the right. AT&T device. I've heard you explain this in the past. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then that'll give her much. That'll print anyway. Yep. And then, okay. um, and then after that, uh, it may even make make everything better because it may be they have such a terrible Wi-Fi. It might. It might. Yeah. yeah. The guy. The guy basically says, "There's nothing I can do. Look at these wires." And he it, he's up right. If it's sixty-year-old wires outside the house, unless AT and T fixes it. Now, it's. I think it's somewhat incumbent on them to do that. So now I'm, the cable company's wires should be newer. Yeah, they'll be much better. And cable is capable of much higher speeds, but it's more expensive. Right. They okay. may not care about that. I'll check my options, and I'll, I'll send you a note when I figure out. Do. Thank you, Peter. Nice to talk okay. to you. Thanks, Keep Leo. listening. Take care. Bye-bye. Yep. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> AT&T has new modems the size of an Xbox. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> That's what I want. You're tuned to Premier Channel 7. Yeah, turn the DSL modem into a bridge. Exactly right. And use a real router. I agree with you. A forest says, I work for a regional DSL provider. Uh, that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, somebody's asking, Web3643 is asking about Ubiquiti. I've been very interested in trying Ubiquiti. We use Ubiquiti here. So our wireless in the studio, because it's very challenging, uses Ubiquiti. For a long time, the problem with Ubiquiti is you had to dedicate a computer running a Java client to keep it running. <laughs> Uh, they've changed that, thank goodness. So um, these ubiquity wire Wi-Fi routers are really interesting. They're powered by a, eth a power over Ethernet (PoE), so they don't need a plug, but they do need Ethernet. So that could be a deal breaker right there. Um, they're like flying saucers. We have them all over the building because we have power, and it it really it, they do they really are better. They're not so. There's three levels of Wi-Fi. There's consumer. There's prosumer, that's where ubiquity probably sits. And there's, you know, enterprise like the HP stuff. Enterprise stuff's gonna be the best, but it's thousands of bucks. It's expensive. Ubiquity's not expensive. They're like 80 bucks a, a unit. So um, but it's horrific to set up. You know, it's just they 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 don't do software well. So their software is kind of however, if you can get it working, and you can. It's just you have to ra wrestle it a little bit. Uh, it'll do a great job. And yeah, you need an air. You need you need the right device. So you need the. I think the air. Does the Air Max run the software now? Is that the way it works? Oh, Project Cars right after the show. Oh, it's not even standard Poe. Oh my God! <laughs> it's twenty four volt, not forty eight volt. Oh my God! So you have to use their PoE injectors. Oh, geez. Yeah, and it's just, they're just Wi-Fi extenders. So you need to have your own, we run it off of, you know, a Staro, a, a style firewall, firewalls and routers. So, you, But they sell a unit that can do that. <sighs> yeah, Ubiquity is for somebody who's got some experience, a Russell, right? And who's you know can, is willing to spend the time. However, I feel like that they are very good stuff. Now I tried. There's something called Eero. Don't rec don't recommend it. E E R O. L they look like little ubiquity things. I wouldn't even be surprised if they're based on ubiquity. Software's phenomenal. You run it on your smartphone. Blah blah blah. <laughs> so I was very excited because it, it's the same premise, you know, as ubiquity. You you set up a 
a base unit, and then you slowly expand your network, and it uses mesh. It doesn't use WDS. It uses mesh to spread your internet. So I thought, very exciting. They sent me a review unit. Set up the base unit. And then what you do is you set up the satellite units, you know, as you would with WDS, kind of midway between the base unit and where you want the Wi-Fi to exist. So I picked a midway point between my office and the gym in our house. Software won't, says, nope, too far away, no signal won't connect. Oh, that's weird, because in fact, I could be in the gym and get the signal, it's just weak. Okay, so this thing didn't get the signal, so I got closer and closer. And the only way I get the Eros, all three Eros to work, is if they're all in the same room. So that's nice, I had great Wi-Fi in my office, but nowhere else in the house. So we sent those back. Actually, that Lucky's Tale or whatever it's called is really fun. I haven't played enough of the game. I didn't, I didn't stay after the show to play. I only played a little bit of Lucky's Tale. Yeah, 5 gigahertz is often better. We do a lot of Raspberry Pi stuff. Watch our Know How show. Uh, that's a, that show is twice a week. And one of the uh, shows is all about making with things like Raspberry Pi. It's really good. So we do a lot of Raspberry Pi stuff. In fact, Father Robert's going to do building an Amazon Echo with your Raspberry Pi, because Amazon has uh, opened the software to do that. Exactly. Perfect. Twisted Mister said it perfectly. 5 gigahertz is better performance. Often will have few, less congestion, but the range is reduced. But we have we have 5G throughout our house. Um, 5G, why do I call it that? We have 54. We have 5, yeah, 5 gigahertz. We, have, we use, there's, my Asus has dual 5 gigahertz bands, and I use those a lot. So it's a three-band router. Marshmallow tips. Yeah, don't, uh, don't let them catch on fire. My suggestion, I like golden brown. I know some people like the crispy burnt ones, but I would say don't let them get on, catch on fire. That's my marshmallow tip. Oh, you're going to love it. Oh, this is, do you like it? It's better than Domino's pizza. It's that good. Awesome. Love the S7, but get a case is tip one, number one. Because if you don't get a case, you'll be sorry. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, internet access, all that jazz. 8888. Ask Leo's the number. George is in Santa Monica, California, our next caller. Hi, George. Hi. It was was going to be a good morning to you, but now it's a good afternoon. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm just a, I just take... Oh, no, no, no. I know you're busy. I'm not busy. Yeah, I just I, talk a lot. <laughs> I apologize. I really, I really enjoyed watching your show yesterday with the Ocular Rift. Ah, uh, we... Uh, yes, yeah, so... Just for those who, I do a podcast, I do many podcasts, one of them, this show's a podcast, but one of them is called The New Screensavers, and uh, we it was it was VR day yesterday on The New Screensavers, you can get the show at twit.tv slash NSS. Uh, our Oculus Rift came, I had been building over the last six weeks, the ultimate virtual reality gaming machine, we had to hustle the build and finish it, because the Rift came faster than I thought it would. And we installed the Rift on the air live and started playing with it. And you know, you it's hard to show it on TV, right, George? You can't you can't right. get the experience. But I think looking at people's faces as they put it on probably was pretty communicative. That was fascinating. <laughs> People were like, "Whoa!" Yeah. Yeah, it's really good. I I am I'm a believer now. It's an experience that you would have to physically have that mask on. It's nothing like anything in this world. That's right. Now, one of the ways they're going to sell this, remember, Facebook paid $2.5 billion for this company and is all in on it, right? So one of the oh, things wow. you're going to start seeing is is uh, stores will have demos. And I've yep. said to anybody who comes to our studios, and we have an open studio, we let people come and watch the shows, just email tickets at twit.tv if you'd like to. And I, anybody who comes to the studio can try the, we'll have the Oculus set up and can try it. We, uh, we had an audience, I don't know, 10, 15 people yesterday, and they all tried it on. And to a person, they loved it. They, they really dug it. And you saw there was a young woman and her uh, boyfriend were in the studio. She's an archaeologist and is interested in developing software that allows students to explore archaeological digs, to explore through history in virtual reality. So she was very interested. And she'd tried previous 
uh, VR solutions like Google's Cardboard and the Gear VR. So that was the young woman, uh, uh, Jessica, who tried it on first. And you yeah. saw her look of just joy. Oh, right. She was thrilled. Yeah. She said, we're buying one immediately. She really, yeah. now the wait is several months at this point. My, my main reason for calling is I have an iPad, and I keep getting a message to upgrade to the iOS 9.3.1. Yes. And I've done that three times. <laughs> and it's still not. So are you doing it on the iPad or through iTunes? So on, the, on my iPad physically. I watch All right. It. So when you on the iPad, when you go to uh, general and software update and it checks for update, does it say you got it or not? No, I, it keeps it there on, on general. It still has a message one to, to upgrade. <laughs> and I've done it three times. Well, that's annoying. It, it's obviously not completing for some reason. Let me tell you what's right. in 931 so you don't worry too much. With 9.3, which was released uh, two weeks ago when the new iPhone and the new iPad Pro came out, um, yes. there was one <laughs> little bug <laughs> that, uh, you know, have, they have a feature in your email and other programs that if you have a, a website address, a web address, you can tap it and Safari will open up and, and go to the website address. That was causing freezing in some cases. If you haven't experienced it, the urgency to get to 931 is not high. Okay, well, let's forget it. <laughs> well, eventually you want to, but you could probably wait till 932, I guess is what I'm saying. Oh, okay. Yeah, if you don't experience that bug, uh, I wouldn't worry about it. Here's what I would suggest, though. One, to try one more time, and here's what you should do. Turn your iPad off completely. A lot of I've, done the hard, I've done the hard shut-off. You've done a hard shut-off, okay. No, oh, I've done that, and it's still doing it. Well, then I don't know what's going on. A lot of people think that you shut off an iPhone or iPad or other device by just pressing the on-off button. That no, no, that's don't. just the screen-off button. And as you know, you have to press and hold the on-off button until you get the message slide to turn off. And when you get that slide to turn off, then slide it, and that will shut the whole thing down. Then the turn hard it shut hard shut off is both buttons and the screen goes black that's another one starts. yeah that's yeah. a different one so this is a normal shutdown it's analogous to a shutdown on a pc where you just you know it shuts itself down in an orderly fashion you're doing what we call a reset you remember on a pc if you had on the front you had a reset button that would yeah. no matter what the computer is doing it could be in the middle of something you press that it goes Voof! well that's what you're doing you're forcing it shut uh, i oh. wouldn't do that unless you know unless you're stuck um, the normal shutdown is normally what you want to do, and that's pressing and holding and then slide to power off. If you're oh, okay. frozen or something's going on that's really weird, then you want to do a reset, which is pressing the, the on-off button and the home button until the thing gives, goes off and gives you a white apple for the boot. That you shouldn't do in the normal course of events. It's only if you really uh, need to, you know, force quit. Yeah. One application that the Ocular Rift could do would be making tours for people that are bedridden so they could sit and watch a physical tour. They feel Absolutely like agree with you. I've been praying that this technology would come along and be advanced by the time I'm in the nursing home, which is imminent, because I plan, I plan to tour the world lying in bed. <laughs> I completely agree with you. This will be amazing. And, you know, I'm 59. I got a few years left. But by by the time I can't really move around very well, I expect this technology to be as good as being there in person. You know what's missing? I'll tell you what's missing. You don't smell anything. You can't feel <laughs> anything. If it's raining, you don't feel rain on your face. But I believe that those those are going to happen as well eventually. I don't know if it'll happen in 20 years, but I think eventually we'll even get... Because you know, right now... You're duplicating only really two senses, seeing and hearing. Uh, they do have touch controllers that's, that are be coming out that will give you a kind of a modicum of touch. It'll at least allow you to reach out and touch. Right now you can't even reach out and touch something, but it'll allow you to reach out and touch something. And then they're going to put vibrators and various things, oh, wow. tactile things in there, so that you'll at least get some feedback. Right now if you use the uh, Xbox control uh, surface with the, the thing, it rumbles a little bit. That gives you some feedback. It's primitive compared to our actual yeah. sense of touch. I think we're, we're going to get there, though, and it, it may only be a few decades before. You know, the ultimate goal is, is the science fiction goal that was uh, 
you know, first espoused by Neil Stevenson in his, uh, in his incredible science fiction uh, book, Snow Crash. He called it the metaverse and used, I think he used, if it's not him, and uh, then maybe uh, uh, Gibson was the first to use it, Neuromancer, the term Jack in. And the idea was we would have a port, we've all seen it now, Matrix and other movies, a port somewhere in the back of our head that we could have some sort of connection to the computer. That's what you need to do. <laughs> to do to do this right. You need to trick your brain into 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 thinking it's it's actually in an environment. You know, we have we don't really live in the world at all. We have a sensorium. We have the five senses, right? Uh, touch and smell and sight and taste um, and hearing. And those, if you think about them, are really kind of like tools that reach out and contact the world. But our brain does a huge amount of processing. You probably know this from, from grade school, but your eyes, when you look through your eyes, the image that's coming in through your eyes is actually upside down. But your brain has learned to flip it. So you don't know it's upside down. You've never seen it the way it actually appears. Similarly, hearing these nerve impulses sound nothing like actual sound, but our brain interprets it. So if you could c connect directly somehow to the brain, this is not easy. <laughs> if you could connect somehow to the brain, you could have an experience as, as vivid as an actual uh, experience in the real world, easily. But we've got to figure out what that interface might be. And I'm sure we're working on it, because <laughs> that, that's the end game, isn't it? Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Our show today brought to you by Wealthfront. Wealthfront's getting so much more sophisticated. I mean, it was already super sophisticated. Wealthfront technology uses the the best thinking of the best minds over 200 years of experience in trading on on Wall Street and encapsulates that information that 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 genius into software which which manages your long-term investments on your behalf it's not day trading it's managing your long-term investments on your behalf and already it's great they've just added artificial intelligence to this so it can actually learn I mean I, this, this this is the future of investment here's the problem you got to save money everybody you, you got to save money you're saving for your retirement you're saving for a rainy day for an emergency you're saving for college for your kids for house day we got to save long-term savings right I mean I don't, I don't have to convince you of that but what how do you save do you put it in a savings account no that's dumb because right now the interest rates on savings accounts aren't keeping up with anything you might as well put it in your mattress at least it's safe in a savings account sort of uh, uh, okay n n not savings account well then you mean you got to invest it now you could do it yourself I could I could tell you right now that's a risky proposition good friend of mine you all know her uh, tried that and she just recently I just started posting on Facebook I'm never doing that again <laughs> lost a lot of money you don't want to do that you could go to an investment advisor these people at least have experience right maybe you get a really good one I mean it's kind of hit or miss but maybe you get a really good one the problem is they charge you 1%, 2%, sometimes 3% of the money you have invested every year. That means you have to make 3% more just to break even. So this is a terrible idea. Wealthfront, because it's a computer, computers work cheap. Wealthfront charges you one quarter of 1%. It's a tiny amount of money. Let me go to wealthfront.com and show you this. I want you to go there now and read up on it. Wealthfront.com slash tech guy. Uh, they've got the best minds. They've created fantastic software. You can look at their performance, and I think you'll see that even in these tough times, they're doing very well. And the thing is, you always know exactly what's going on. Your Their dashboard tells you every minute of the day what's happening. And unlike a human advisor or even you, they, don't, they monitor it continuously rebalancing, reinvesting, tax loss harvesting to increase your returns while minimizing taxes, and all of that's built in. They even have a portfolio review you can use right now, totally free, to see what your current investment strategy is doing. The process is based on Nobel Prize winning academic research, the best investment practices from the best minds. And you can get started for as little as 500 bucks. but I want you to go there right now and read about it first. You've got to read about it before you invest. Of course, be smart. Spend a, spend a little time just looking at Wealthfront.com. 
Five hundred dollars is the minimum investment, but just because you're listening today, we're going to arrange it so you get your first fifteen thousand dollars free of charge forever. Not one quarter of one percent, but forever free. That's a great way to start that nest egg. Go to wealthfront.com slash tech guy, get the free portfolio review, and your first fifteen thousand dollars free of charge for life. Wealthfront.com slash tech guy. It's not investment, it's savings. That's really important. It's the best way to save. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. 888-827-5536. Coming up in 10 minutes. All right, make it 15. Our, uh, our photo guy, Chris Marquardt, with some digital photography tips. John's on the line from Los Alamitos, California. Hi, John. Hi, Leo. How are you? I'm very well. How are you? All right. I, I wanted to get um, some information on a hands-free mouse, and my research has taken me as far as uh, the light pointer uh, that you attach well, it, from a, a strap on the head. Right. And you hit the, you direct the uh, light to the, to a whatever you want to open up on the. On yeah, a so and then a, and then there's a pedal and then yeah, that's like, there are a variety of choices. This is a, a design for uh, people who have various disabilities. So it depends on what you can do. There's puffers. There's there's uh, head mounted pointers. There's foot pointers. It really depends on what your capabilities are. Is this is it? Do you are you disabled or is this uh, just something you don't want to use your hands anymore? I don't because I'm I'm a classical pianist uh -huh. and also jazz and I noticed that uh, I was trying to save my right hand to go to my left and I was using the mouse uh, with my left yeah. and now I'm getting that pain in my thumb. No, that's not her. Oh my gosh, let's protect your hands at all costs. Wow, are you professional? Do you do you do this for a living? Uh, no, I'm a teacher. Oh, but wonderful! I play things, you know, lift Rachmaninoff, the oh, very complex things. That list and, stuff, man. Wow. It, it, yeah, uh, I was playing the other day, and then and then my thumb snapped, and I just like in the middle of something I was playing. So <clears throat> I want I want to make sure that I can, you know, play this stuff without sacrificing my hands because I'm using a mouse. So <sighs> okay. So the first thing I tell people to try is a trackball. Um, reason being, it's a different kind of movement. It's still mouse-like. Really, if you think of a mouse as uh, as a device with a ball on the bottom, the ball detects the movement of the of the mouse on top of it and moves a pointer on the screen. A trackball is just an inverted mouse. Instead of moving the mouse, you move the ball, which means you can do small movements. You won't use your thumb at all, probably. You do small movements with your forefinger. Uh, your thumb you would use maybe for clicking. You should try that as an alternative. They're inexpensive. They're they're completely work the same way as a mouse so you don't have to change your computer setup or anything like that um, and I, I for a lot of people with carpal tunnel from mousing uh, this is a good solution most of the time people get carpal tunnel by the way not so much from mousing but from keying um, so you also you know may want to reduce the amount of keyboard you use some kind of voice-activated uh, typing system. Yes, there are some great solutions for that, and some of them you don't need to use a mouse at all. You can uh, you can do it all via voice. They do make ergonomic keyboards as well. They're, sometimes they're split. Microsoft makes a, a good one. They have they they have they keep your wrists and arms in a more natural position. I would research if I were you ergonomics in general because this is not just the mouse. This is how your arms are placed, how you're sitting how your hands are, the angle of your wrists. You want to have it be a natural angle. If your wrists are tilted up as you're doing all this stuff, that can cause issues, including carpal tunnel. The last thing you'd want is a professional pianist. Um, I don't, I'm not really familiar with the pedal mouses. I've seen them used in the head-mounted mouses. There's the Tracker, tra or Track IR, which has been around for a long time. A lot of people um, <laughs> are familiar with this uh, that watches your head movements. There are mouse mice that you hold in the air. They're kind of like the Nintendo uh, Wii's controller where it's sensing movement not on the ground but in the air. But there's so many of these that it's hard for me to say which one would be the best uh, for so it, you. It would seem, yeah, because it, it, for the, the, the light pointer, from the, uh, directing it from your, your uh, 
forehead, it seemed like it would be hard to aim it right. Yeah, and, and it's, it's going to be hard on your right. neck. People only, I'll be honest, people do that only because they can't use a mouse for for a variety of reasons, right? It's not, this, It's. I, I think you'd find it more frustrating. So my suggestion, and this is frustrating enough, is to start with the trackball and see if that helps. Okay. Kensington, uh, Logitech, a number of companies make them. Uh, I have. I use a, a Logitech trackball. Uh, they're great, and they give you all of the functionality of a mouse in a, in a fashion that's analogous, but completely different movements for your hand. And even moving, you know, from your left hand to your right hand into the trackball and kind of mixing it up might be sufficient, because of course it's overuse that's the problem. Right. right? Okay. At least give those a try before you go to the foot pedals, which are or the head mounted d devices, which have a steep learning curve. Um, your neck muscles, for instance, have never done this before, so you're going to be in pain for a while. Uh, people generally choose these alternatives because they have no choice. They have severe carpal tunnel; they can't use their wrists, uh, or they have a disability that prevents them from using their hands. Um, and so, all of these uh, alternatives are great because they make the technology accessible. But they do have a steep learning curve. The, the beauty of the mouse is that it doesn't require that much to get used to it. Uh, actually, touch is probably superior to a mouse, isn't it? And that's another thing you might want to look at is a touchscreen laptop. Um, there are a great variety of these right now. My favorite, current favorite is the Dell XPS 13 and 15. These, if you pay a little extra, come with very nice touchscreens. And you may not use the mouse at all because you 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 tap to tap the screen, and uh, that is a really nice way to do it. If you're using a Mac, there are no touch screens, but of course an iPad is uh, is Apple's touch operating system, is the iOS operating system, and an iPad Pro, either the the giant 12 inch or the new 10 inch, might be a good alternative as well. You never use a mouse on a uh, on an iPad, do you? In fact, there's so many great music programs on the iPad. I would say that'd be a, that'd be another thing to look at. And uh, touch is probably the most natural, right? That's something uh, even two-year-old children you'll you'll give them an iPad or an iPhone, and they grok it immediately. They can sit down. I've seen two-year-olds launch Netflix, go to Phineas and Ferb, and start the show so they can watch it. They can't even read yet. They don't need to. It's such a natural interface. The next most natural probably is the mouse. And I don't, I don't know if you remember the first time you used a mouse. In the early days of Windows, they had training. You had to, you had to they, before you could use the operating system, I think the Apple, uh, Apples did this too. Before you could use the operating system, they said, okay, now, here's how you use a mouse. Um, and so I, I think there is a little bit of a learning curve. At the same time, I see people sit down and use a mouse for the first time and pretty quickly, within an hour, become proficient. So that's the next best. Trackballs will take a little bit more to learn. Um, and then a really steep learning curve for things like pedals and head-mounted pointing devices. I think that, I think that uh, start with touch, actually. Touch is the future. It's so natural. It's just, it, it's, it's how we interact with the world, isn't it? We reach out and touch something. And when you see little, little babies using touch interfaces, I, I worry for these kids. <laughs> Frankly, you see a lot of kids now using a laptop, a Mac laptop. They can't use it. It's, I can't. It's not. <laughs> I'm trying to <laughs> scroll and nothing happens. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More of your calls. Chris Marquardt coming up right after this. Hello, computer. Hello, computer. Just use the keyboard. The keyboard. How oh, quaint. <laughs> That's the one I was looking for. Sorry it took me so long. Hey, Chris Marquardt. <laughs> oh, well, I'm red in the face. Why are you red in the face? I don't know. It's, it's, it, I'm oh, so much that. redder than you. Let me see. Let me see. Uh, that may just be my monitor. Hey, <laughs> yeah, this red. looks a bit better. Yeah, you're let me take some saturation out here. This yeah, is better. Much better. Yeah, typical photographer. How are you? Always fussing with it, always editing the photos. We I, have an assignment review. Oh, I put something in there. Maybe I maybe I lucked out and got it, but I got because yeah, I have my, maybe. Let's my see. new Let's like see. a cube. We, we might have four pictures to look at oh. today. <laughs> now you're just currying favor. <laughs> <laughs> I, by the Let, way. Let's see what I have to say I about am, it, though. I am so glad I bought this camera. I oh, man. love. This is all I use You're happy now. with it? Yeah, and I have the A7R really, too. Yeah. Um, so what are you doing with the Sony? 
If I, well, I, I, knew, I, I would know someone who would take no, it out no, of no. Your hands I'm keeping you. that because I need the uh, uh, 42 okay. megapixels. This is only 24, but um, Lisa's yeah, using the A7 RS with with the Leica lens, and she loves that. You know, there's something about Leica glass. Oh, Leica glass is the best in the world. I don't know what it is. Both Lisa and I look at it, and we go, "Is it color? Is it?" It's this clarity. It's something. It's the contrast. It's the it's the bokeh. It's the way it, it renders the out of focus something. parts of the picture. It's it's creamy. I like the bokeh, but it's but it's more than that. There's and and it's my the reason I put that image in there is because I didn't that was unretouched. There's no color or anything. And it, you, 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 we're, we're talking about the picture you took of Lisa, right? Yeah, that's unretouched at the, at the seaside. And there's yeah, yeah. something about the color that I just can't get in the A7R2. <laughs> So, I mean, I can get it with the Nike, with the uh, Leica lens, but I can't. Uh, this, I just, this camera is also, it's just simple, which I really like. It's knobby. You just do the knobs. Yeah. It doesn't uh, have a lot of stuff. No. And it's pretty much what you need. Yeah. It's 28 millimeters, no zooming. You got to walk. And uh, no, I'm, I'm very, been very happy with uh, the way it captures light. I think that's the real, that's what it's really. And it has a macro feature, which is nice. Because I don't have oh, a Oh, really? Does yeah. it? Yeah. Okay. I don't have a macro on my A7, so um, macro lens. So that's nice. I must mean, believe me. I still I'm going to use the A7R2. That's an amazing camera. That's more like a. That's kind of like a, wow. a medium format camera, really. With all you're the specs. you're upgrading your photography. I'm done. Quite a bit there. I said I was done, but <laughs> I, but now I'm actually done. Let's, <laughs> let's talk about yeah, let's talk about that in yeah, half a year from now. Yeah, yeah. Is he done? Uh, well, as I said, I can't spend any more money for a while, so I'm 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 pretty much done. But I don't. But I feel good. I don't need to. Uh, this is such a beautiful. God, I just you know, and I'm not even using the film cameras anymore because I just like this is, this is the camera I use all the every time. You know, and this and the, the film Ace, cameras and the display S7. case. I just I just had a I just held a large format photography workshop over the weekend. Oh, fun! How was that? Yeah, oh, pff, amazing as usual. It's kind of it takes everything to the next level. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Time to talk photography with our digital photo guy. Chris Marquardt is here, back from his jaunts around the world. He was in Siberia, Lake Baikal, some beautiful pictures. We talked about those last week. And we gave you a little extra time to take your own pictures of water, right, Chris? Yep, water was the assignment, and lots of people participated um, including some Laporte I, guy, I'm I not sure. I finally said, you know, I, I really <laughs> ought to participate in this, and uh, well, let's, so let's, I uploaded let's, some some images. But you're going to pick, and you're not going to you're going to pick without favor, unbiased. I'm picking three, and and then we'll have a quick look at this uh, fourth picture today. <laughs> oh, oh, I didn't make the I didn't make the cut. Well, that's fine. That's no, fine. No, you just That's just fine. Kind of outside the competition. All right. What, do you, what let's let's take a look at three from our So we should explain how we do this. Every month Chris gives us a word, uh, a concept to illustrate with a picture. There's no prize for this. You can use any camera. All you have to do to and quote enter is take take a lot of pictures, pick your favorite every week, tag it with the word in this case water and upload it to our Flickr group on, uh, uh, it's called the Tech Guy group. Renee Silverman, our moderator, will say thank you for your submission. And then every month or so, Chris will pick three images from that collection and, and talk about why he thinks they're interesting. So you've got three today. Yeah, the first picture was submitted by Brendan Burkett um, called Ohio River. And it just nicely illustrates one of the things that you can do with water. Um, and uh, what Brendan did is he put his camera on a tripod. Oh, he beautiful. put a, an ND filter on the camera, a 10-stop ND filter, which is like sunglasses for the camera. It takes light away so you can expose longer. And he made this into a 30-second exposure. So what happens to the water is uh, the surface where, where you typically see waves and things turn silky smooth, very flat. Actually, you see a streak under that bridge that is a ship going by and um, it just it just gives that w the water surface a bit of a surreal feeling. And I've seen lots of these kind of pictures and this is a really nice one. So 30 seconds, but you'll get different effects for, for all different settings with water, won't you? Oh, and you, 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 can, you can expose 
let's say you have a little waterfall, you expose for two seconds and then uh, try for 10 seconds and then try for 30 seconds. And all those three pictures will look very, very differently. And of course, if you expose very shortly, you'll freeze the water, the motion in the water. And uh, if you expose longer, you get this flowing motion. And this is kind of an extreme example. 30 seconds is quite long for water. So this really kind of smooths, smooths out the the surface really well and, and i like it that he chose black and white i mean a lot of almost all cameras now are shooting color but it's easy enough to make it black and white with software and uh, and this really is a good black and white image i think oh i like i like the intricate detail in the bridge as well there's uh the clouds on the right top there's nice detail in the sky it's kind of a nice little complete picture we uh, put links to all of the images we're talking about on our website, techilabs.com, if you want to. I know it's weird to talk about pictures on the radio, but use your imagination. And the, the, what we're talking about is, is techniques that you can use in your own images. All right, very nice. Ohio River, thank you, Brennan Burkett, for that one. And the second one is by uh, Techie Gadget, and uh, he or she took a picture titled okay well dsc 09757 oh i know you I hate that <laughs> the, doesn't have a real name but hey anyway the picture was kind of intriguing it is a picture of a, an oil platform i think yeah. somewhere out in yeah. the sea from really far away in front of a sunset now what happens is you see the sun is really big in this picture so um it's over water so it's, it's kind of related to water and what Techie Gadget did is uh, he or she put a really long lens on the camera. It doesn't have any EXIF data, so we can't really tell from the details, but it must have been like seven, 800 millimeters long at least. So that is a very, very long focal length, a very telephoto lens. And this way you get the sun being really, really big and then putting that platform in the front of it means uh, that he or she had to be really in the right spot to get that uh, to get that alignment going. I mean, that really only happens if you are in the exact right spot. So there must have been some planning in that. And then what you get with a very long telephoto lens is you get this, it, it's almost like, like uh, I don't know, you know, on a sunny day when the air goes all, <laughs> when the air moves and yeah, you have this, yeah, this kind of shimmering, yeah. Shimmering, that's yeah. the word I was looking for. Yeah. So so you, you don't get the straight lines. Everything is kind of slightly blurry in a weird way. And that really adds to the feeling of that. So that's that's a good shot. Really, really nice. Our third image. The third image is by MJ Muscado, Balboa Pier. And that's Ooh. another thing you can do with a camera. The, that's the opposite of the very long lens that was taken with a fisheye lens. That's mm -hmm. an eight mil nine millimeter fisheye lens, which kind of, it's under a pier. So you see the sea in front, you see a pier above you, and then the waves coming in, uh, sloshing against the, the legs of the pier. And the fisheye makes it so that all the parallel lines kind of go go in circles around the center of the camera. So everything kind of bends towards the outside. That's the fisheye effect. And of course, with a lot of parallel lines like you have in, in this pier, that really gives it a really strong effect. So very nice. that's, that's very a very nice. nice and very cool effect. Well, three great images. Uh, really pleased that uh, we got all three of those submissions. Uh, it's really fun. When that's the fourth one. That's the fourth one. Oh. Yeah, Mr. Laporte <laughs> submitted it. <laughs> You're trying to get around this. <laughs> I'm trying to get out of the critique. All right, yeah. I thought, you know, I uh, haven't submitted in so long. And it, it I'll was, be gentle. <laughs> be, be kind. Be kind. You know, you know, when I saw this, okay, so this picture shows uh, the sea and uh, the shore being, I don't know, overgrown with something green. And then there's a woman with a red jacket uh, around her waist. And so a fence of some sort. This is my wife, Lisa. That's Lisa. On a cliff and the, face, about to fall into the ocean, but she's got to get that shot. And she's she she looks the she looks the part absolutely. Um, the two things that I immediately noticed at, at this picture and that I really like is the first thing is it's an RGB picture. It's got red, green, and blue oh, in it. It's it does, got like it? Yeah. it it covers it covers the primary colors, and that is. I think very pleasing in a photo. And the second is the fence makes these interesting lines pointing towards her, even though she doesn't need additional attention in the picture because she has that red jacket around her waist. So that's kind of a focal point anyway. And she's the only human being in the picture, which also uh, 
gets a lot of attention. But the lines of the fence really help that. And then it's an overall nice picture. Thank you. You were kind. You were gentle. Um <laughs> The color I was shot that, with a really good camera. Yeah, right? well, yeah, that's the that's the <laughs> that's the only reason I uploaded it. I had just gotten a brand new camera, the Leica Q, which I, I ridiculously expensive camera. But I uh, we went to Mendocino, which is up uh, in northern California coast, and it's be the ocean's beautiful and roiling, and it turned out to be a gorgeous day. And uh, so I got some really great images. But what always what pleased me and surprised me a little bit about the camera is the color of the ocean was much more vivid than it really was in real life. This is not retouched. And I suppose it's not accurate, but boy, it sure feels good. It's very blue. Well, you know, it's not always about accuracy. It's often about exactly what it makes you feel like. Yeah, this. yeah. It, 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 that was a fun day, and Elisa had a good time shooting, and I did too. We had a lot of fun. Well, thank awesome. you, Chris. Now the job is to come up with a new assignment for next month, and I will take another picture. Or two. <laughs> so, so I thought, what what is the opposite of water? Let's, let's try to find something that is not water, and I came up with dirt. Dirt. Dirt, dirt made my lunch. All right, Chris Marquardt's at discoverthetopfloor.com. You got a month. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I actually, I think I have Lisa's image. I should, I should find that because that would be nice pairing uh, with the two. Dirt is good. Oh, you, you, you mean that that very picture? She's I think, I right think there. I might have that. I'll have to, I'll have to ask Lisa if. Uh, I mean, you know, she she is really good about taking her shots immediately, uh, putting them online on her website. and uh, Oh, yes, yeah. she is, yeah. The, I, you know, I feel like the blue was there. Uh, it just isn't as vivid in real life, perhaps. But uh, <laughs> same with the green. I mean, the colors, uh, to be honest, the colors that the Leica gets are... I would really like to have a look under the hood and see what these cameras do in software these days. Because, I mean, I mean, I know that the iPhone uh, camera does a lot of things like, like it, they detect grass and they detect sky and right. then they treat those differently. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't be surprised if the Leica did something similar. There's a Leica richness, for, you know. That's just... Leica for a long time has done, has done like geometry corrections and vignetting corrections yeah. and things in software. Right. Um, I'm pretty sure there's something going on there. It's like, oh, the camera can now right. kind of maybe see that that's, uh, that's the C and then it treats it differently. I mean, I'm using the RAWs, I'm sure, but um, maybe not. These might be, I think these are the, the RAWs. The th I love this image just because of the bokeh and uh, the, there's a crispness that you get to the Leica that is remarkable. I just really, yep. like these, these ice plants these are just like, they jump out at you. It's almost 3D. It's a really neat, uh, just a beautiful effect. Ah, yeah, ah, new toys. Wonderful new toy, <laughs> I, must, <laughs> I must say. Well, enjoy it. Enjoy thank it. you, Chris. All right, dirt. We'll do some dirt. dirt. All right, thank you, Chris. Have a great Talk one. Talk to you next week. All righty, see you. Take care. Bye-bye. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888-ASK-LEO. That's my phone number. Crank up the uh, tech guy and let's <laughs> let's talk high tech. Uh, Mike in the uh, line here for a, a call from Fountain, Colorado. Mike, thanks for your patience. Welcome. Oh no, patience is free. <laughs> um, you. You've guided me correctly more times than I care to think about. Both me calling in and you over the air. And I want your advice on possibly spending some money. Oh, I love to spend people's money. Go right ahead. Let's well, see here. I've been watching your Bergum build. Yeah, Urvergum. Urvergum. The ultimate right. virtual reality gaming machine. Even watch the one with the ID10T incident. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, the tech guy can make mistakes just like anybody else. Hey, we're all human. Yeah. You I know. make the mistakes so you can learn by my feeble errors. Indeed. I'm running a six-year-old uh, Core 2 Duo Quad computer nice. using the EVGA motherboard. I've upgraded the video card and all the rest of it. I got nine GTX 970 uh, because I want to be able to do 4K to my TV. Good. And, by the way, you could run the Oculus Rift on that 970. Yeah, indeed. Uh, what I'm thinking of doing is uh, upgrading to the Skylake. Okay, that's the latest Intel processor. Right, and it'd be the i7. Mm, uh, Newegg nice. has a deal currently for a motherboard, the processor, and memory, and I have all the additional stuff. 
Yeah. Uh, currently, my Windows Experience Index <laughs> uh, gives me a rating of 7.1. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's, that's fast. For, that's for all the uh, CPU and memory functions. Uh, I'm 7.6 for the video function. Nice. Uh, but it is a six-year-old computer. Isn't that ironic? Because it's running pretty well. Yes, it's running very well. I think putting in the uh, new video card really helped a lot. Oh, geez. Well, yeah. I want, I've want i constantly upgraded the video card. Yeah. yeah, that makes a big difference. That's why you're getting oh, yeah. such a good video score. Oh, yeah. Uh, currently, uh, the computer basically, I do a lot of transcoding. Uh -huh. Aha, yeah, that's, that's why you want a high-end computer, because converting from one video format to another, a.k.a. transcoding, is, is, is very CPU-intensive. Ooh, yes. And it, it can be GPU, depending on the uh, if, if it'll software. allow you to use the GPU. Yeah, some software will let you use the graphics card, because it turns out the capabilities of a graphics card are closely related to transcoding. So in some cases, they'll let you do that. But nowadays, uh, modern Intel pl platforms really do quite a good job with, oh, yeah. with video codecs. Yes. Uh, it's uh, the i7-6700K. I think that's the same, same one that you That's use. the one we have. Yeah, this is a nice yeah. machine you're building here. Uh, it's a Gigabyte GA7170X Gaming Revision 1. Same, same, uh, same one we're using, I think. Yeah. Well, you're using an Asus. Yeah. What are you using? Oh, gigabit, gigabyte, right? Gigabyte. This is what. That's funny because they have the same number. I have an Asus 170A, the right. C170A. All right. And uh, it comes with uh, 16 gigabits of uh, the SD RAM. I have another case, a full tower, which I'm going to put this the new build in. Sounds great. If I buy it. And it's five hundred and sixty-nine dollars. Isn't that remarkable? I mean, you're getting what would have been a mainframe computer ten years ago, right? You know, a supercomputer at five hundred bucks. Amazing. Well, five fifty. Five fifty. All right. Do <laughs> uh, you think it's a good idea to do uh, that way? I turn the old computer into a server. Well. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, I can't be. I really can't be the judge of what's good for you, but that sounds very nice. I spent ten times more oh, yeah. on a computer that probably is not going to be significantly faster than that. So okay. I think that sounds uh, very good. Um, are, you're going to run SSDs, obviously. Yes, I am. The, currently the new solid-state drives make such a difference. The SSDs we used are on the PCI bus. They're M2 SSDs. This uh, board allows two. Very oh, nice. The M2's on. Very it. nice. And M2 makes a big difference in speed. That's even faster than a. See, the the solid state drives are so fast now that they're actually outpacing the SATA bus. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, or or close to saturating the SATA bus, which is the normal way you connect a hard drive. So newer machines, including by the way, many machines you'd buy from Dell and Apple. Apple, all of Apple's uh, newest laptops use. PCI Express bus, which is a faster bus than the SATA bus, right. and that means you can you can take advantage of those really fast solid state drives. So I think I think you're in good shape there. I uh, I like that a lot. Now remember, when you build your own PC, I don't have to tell you this. Yes, but... I have to do my own <laughs> troubleshooting. Yeah, I don't. I know you know this, but for everybody listening, in general, it's best to buy a computer from. Uh, you know, a company that's make the whole thing. That way you have one number to call if something's not working. Uh, the computers that uh, Mike and I are uh, built uh, or building um, require us to do the tech support because it could be that, you know, if you call Gigabyte and say, well, something's wrong, they'll say, well, it's probably not us. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, it's satisfying in another way because you, you have the experience of carefully choosing each component and you learn about it. And then when you're when you're finished, you know Steve Gibson, who does our security show, uh, just built a very similar machine. He also used a gigabyte motherboard, although he chose not to get high-end video cards for graphics output, but for, he wanted to drive eight monitors. monitors. <laughs> ah, you know about this. Yes. So uh, he got lesser uh, quadro cards. They're some you know lesser for gaming, but but fine for running eight monitors. And uh, I think he he of course knows what he's doing. Built and tell him machine. Never Ten is wonderful. Ah. He's the guy who wrote that software. It'll keep you on Windows 7, and you'll never get another ping from Microsoft about why you haven't upgraded. 
Well, I will upgrade when I build the new machine. I think so. I think you want to. Uh, that's another question. Dual booting. Does Windows 10 allow you to dual boot? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Does it allow you to triple boot? Uh, at that point, you probably want to use a, a boot manager rather than the Windows. Windows will let you multi-boot different copies of Windows, but doesn't do well with other operating systems. Well, they're all Windows copies. All right. All Windows you know, I haven't... XP 7 and 10. Yeah, I haven't really... You really XP 7 and 10. I haven't really tried that. You know, in in previous versions of Windows, if you had a version of Windows installed during the installation, it would say, oh, I see you have Windows. Would you like me to overwrite it, upgrade it, or keep it and have a multi-boot system? I, didn't, I don't know if 10 does that or not. And I actually bought a Windows 10 disk. Wow, aren't you fancy? Well... <laughs> I did. I, I did too. Of course, you have to. Yeah, you know. <laughs> you don't get a free upgrade for a new machine, but uh, I think um, you know. I'm not an expert on this, but I think that the Windows will handle dual boot or multi boots of all Windows, and then we do have some other excellent um, choices for uh, boot third party boot managers. But right. if it's all Windows, I don't see that there's an issue with that. You might want to say you might want to try XP in a virtual machine since you probably won't run it very often. Well, that's what I've been running uh, XP in yeah. for. And I think you're gonna you might run into issues. Microsoft's already said, hey, we really don't want to support oh, you know, older operating systems on newer hardware. Yeah. That's why I want to get in now before Intel yeah. does the lockdown. The, uh, the new uh, boot system, they've replaced BIOS with something that really is a, fair, a, really a fair amount of trouble called UEFI. Yeah. And uh, I don't think XP is going to support the UEFI. So. Okay. You, might, you, won't, you don't want to downgrade your system capabilities just so you can run XP. No. It's uh, there's a few programs on there and do it in virtual. Yeah, do it, read on there. Doing virtualization and of course seven has an XP mode. Right. That might even be sufficient. Excellent. Hey, enjoy your new PC. That sounds awesome. A lot, a lot of times uh, people call mostly just to, just to talk about. This is one thing that happens when you build PCs, and if you go to a user group or hang out with geeks, a lot of times. I, I saw this with Steve. I do it. Mike does it. We just want to, we just kind of, showing off's not the right word. Just want to kind of, it's like a custom car, right? You ever go to a car show? People go to car shows to show their build. See what I did? Look at that. Isn't that nice? And then other enthusiasts go, oh, that's really nice. See what I did over here? It's part of the fun of it, actually. <laughs> I apologize for your, uh, wasting your time this afternoon. More of your calls coming up, 8888-ASK-LEO. Everything we talk about, including I'll put a list of the things we put in our ultimate virtual reality gaming machine on our website, too, so you can see. I also will refer you to PC Perspective, which is a great website. They were very instrumental in, in getting the parts for us, helping us figure out what parts to use, pcper.com. That'll all be at techguylabs.com, our site. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Ah. Our show today brought to you by Epson, the makers of the amazing EcoTank printer. I, I love you, Epson. I've always loved Epson. I've always used Epson for my photo printing, for my day-to-day -day printing. Epson laser printers, Epson inkjet printers, Epson dot matrix printers going back to the earliest days of computing. But I have to say, as much as I love Epson, I love you even more now because you are standing up for your users with these new Epson EcoTank printers. And I think you, as a user of, ink, of inkjet printers, you know what I'm talking about here. You're in the middle of a print job. All of a sudden, you're out of ink. you got to go to the store, get more cartridges at an exorbitant price. Wouldn't it be awesome if you didn't have to buy inkjet cartridges? If you just could... I mean, everybody's thought of this. Why don't they just have a tank on the printer? You know, like an ink tank that you just load up and then they would just print from that. When you run out, you just, you know, you have buy bottles of ink and you put it in. Wouldn't that be better? Yes, it would. That's why Epson did it. The Epson Eco Tank printers, and there's a whole range of them, including in this one, the ET4550. These are great printers with tanks on the side that you load with bottles. They come with the bottles in the box. In fact, Lisa bought the ET4550, and it had uh, the ink in the in the box. I put it in. It was very easy to do. Now she's going to print for 11,000 black pages, 
or 8,500 color pages, about 50 ink cartridges worth of printing without new ink. And when she has to buy new ink, she'll save up to 80% with the low-cost replacement bottles. But it's not just the, the 4550. This is, by the way, a great wireless printer does all the wonderful things that Precision Core technology does, including laser quality, black text, vivid colors, auto two-sided printing. It's got a 30-page auto document feeder that actually works. And it prints wirelessly from your smartphones, from your tablets. It's got, you can, you can scan to the cloud. I do that all the time. CES 2016 Innovation Award honoree this year. The ET4550. But then, but then if you're in a work group, they've got bigger ones. This is my favorite. I just like looking at this one. I don't, I don't think I'd buy it because I don't I don't print that much. The WFR4640, 20,000 pages of ink in the box. And instead of bottles, when you have to replace the ink, ultra low cost ink packs. This is awesome. No warm-up time, laser speed, about three seconds a page. Incredibly high quality printing. And the ink is in the tank. You're going to love it. All EcoTank printers deliver an unbeatable combination of convenience and value with ultra-low-cost replacement ink bottles. I, I'm all in on the EcoTank. I love it. You will, too. Visit Epson.com slash EcoTank today to transform the way your home, your office, your work group prints for the best combination of ease and value. Turn to the new Epson EcoTank printers. EPSON.com slash EcoTank. And we thank them so much for their support of the Tech Guy podcasts. We appreciate it. Thank you, Epson. Thank you for a great printer, too. Epson, exceed your vision. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. Time to talk about computers, the Internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, and all that jazz. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number, 8888-ASK. Leo, the website, techguylabs.com. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, that's it. Chatroom, irc.twit.tv. But you'll find that, the, the phone number and everything, and the website uh, at techguylabs.com. And by the way, that's free and there's no sign-up. So head on, hi the over there. Show of hands, how many of you ordered a Tesla Model 3? The new uh, electric V. What? You ordered one? No. <laughs> you did, though, right? Yeah. Yeah, two, 200, well, let me just count real quick. One, two, three, 252,000 of you in the first 24 hours. Wow. That means I think the Tesla Model 3 is, is a hit. And I'm sure that Elon Musk, the founder of Tesla, is dabbing his brow in relief a little bit because had it not been a hit, I wonder how long the company would have continued on. This, this, this Tesla thing is great. It's, a, it's an example of a gambler going to the table and parlaying one chip into a pile of chips. And at, at, at every step of the way, right on the tip, the tipping point of the bankruptcy, just like uh, Tesla's been making cars there for some years, never made any money, spending a lot of money, making very expensive cars. First the Roadster, the Model S, the Model X, which is kind of just starting to come out now. And at each stage of the way, it's like, man, they're not making any money. They get keep getting more investment money. Elon puts more of his money in. But it was all aimed at this end point, which is to make a relatively affordable electric vehicle with good range. Um, and that's the Model 3. Starts at $35,000, although Elon tweeted that he expected that the, you know, the average configuration would be more like $42,000. You might get some benefit from tax credits. It's unknown because even if you put a thousand dollars down on March 31st and got in that long line—that's a long 252,000 person line—it'd uh, be likely you won't see your car, even if you're number one in that line, until late 2017, maybe early 2018. And if you're number 252,000 in that line, mm, yeah, you're gonna be waiting a little longer. How does 2020 sound? But if you're Tesla, you can now go to the financial markets and say, look at this. We got 252,000, a quarter of a million people who say, we want this car. And here's a thousand bucks. It's not merely like, I, yeah, I, yeah, I want that car. I'll sign on the dotted line. That's a thousand dollars from each of them saying, we want this car as quickly as you can get it, which means that they can go to the markets. They can get more money. They can 
build up their plant, maybe build another plant, they can crank this production up. What's interesting is it's taken so long to get to that point that other car companies have started to catch up. Chevrolet announced in January and says they will start shipping in the fall, and this is a car company that has some experience with that, the new Chevy Bolt, B-O-L-T, Bolt, as in bolt of lightning, that will have a similar range. We're talking 200 miles on a charge and be at a similar price, about $35,000. And that's really interesting. I wonder how many of those people who put money down on a Model 3 would be would consider a Chevrolet. Why wouldn't they, right? Is it that Tesla is the Apple computer of cars and that, oh, you got to have that? Is the Bolt the, the IBM PC of cars? I don't know. For some reason, people love the company Tesla and they love the idea of, uh, of buying a Tesla. And I'm, I'm hoping the Bolt sells as well. In some countries, gas vehicles will no longer be available in a few years. The Netherlands just announced, we're not going to allow you to buy a gas vehicle soon. We are only going to allow you to buy electric vehicles. What? Zero emissions. And that's the first domino in what I expect will be a, a quick transition from, uh, from fossil fuels to renewables. India says by 2030, they want to have 100% electric vehicles on the road. Norway says by 2025, they want to be fully electric. That's when the Dutch parliament said, we're going to ban the sale of new petrol and diesel cars, 2025. Now, that's not yet a law in, in, in uh, Holland, but it is in Norway, and India is their strong hope. I think we're moving in that direction. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And a disclaimer, I have put down $5,000. That's a hefty deposit on a, a Tesla Model X. No word at all as to when I'll see that. There are people who've been waiting for years. But that's part of the Tesla experience. <laughs> It's, it's, you, it's like you know, it's like getting in line for an iPhone times a thousand. Because instead of waiting hours, you're waiting years, and you have to pay for the privilege. Yikes! Eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo. That's the phone number. Lewis on the line from Monrovia, California. Our next caller. Hi, Lewis. Hi, Leo. Thanks for taking my call. Thanks for calling. Well, uh, about two weeks ago, I bought a Galaxy S7 uh, phone, and uh, as did I, got it, got it about uh, yeah, that about that long ago, right here. And yeah, so then I also bought the Samsung wireless charger. Mm -hmm. And that night when I plugged it in, it seemed it was charging just fine, but when I took the phone off the charger, opened the app, I discovered that the home key and the soft keys uh, weren't working anymore; they're disabled. And the only way I was able to get out of the app or do anything else with the phone was by uh, shutting down the phone and restarting. So I thought that might be a fluke. So I tried it again, and every time I would put it on a charger, the same thing would happen. Oh, you need to bring the phone back and get a new one. I did that the next day. They gave me a brand new phone and uh, went home, put on a charger, and the same thing happened. So I mm. wasn't sure at that point if it was an app that was doing it or not. So. I, I charge my phone wirelessly every single night. And have never uh -huh. seen that behavior. Yeah, even the people at the store that sold me a phone told me that no one has complained about that issue. And uh, I went ahead and uh, uh, did a factory reset on the phone, took everything off just to see if it was the app that was causing it. And uh, when I put the phone back on the wireless charger, it, it did the same thing again. And uh, so I went to the store yesterday and I showed them the problem. I even tried a different wireless charger they had on display, and it, the problem still persisted. And uh, they ended up giving me a brand new wireless charger, the fast charging one. I took it home last night, tried it, and it's still doing the problem. So I looked online. I haven't found anyone posting. You're anything. the only one, dude. What? A, so you did you install all your apps when you uh, when you got the phone? Yeah, after All right, I, here's uh, what you have to do, and I'm sorry to say it, but this is what you have okay. to do, is wipe okay. the phone, do a complete reset, factory reset, and don't install your apps. Don't install anything. Okay. And see if it works. Okay. And if it does, ah, 
It, and by the way, it has to be this because uh, unless there's some weird, you know, atmospheric disturbance over your bed, the only thing that's unique to your phone is the stuff you've put on it, right? Because I have the same exact phone, and I'm charging it wirelessly all the time, uh, and 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 I have never seen anybody complain of this issue. Um, yeah, that's it because it's two phones that's done it to already. Yeah, no, that's interesting. So it must the only thing in common between those two phones is well there's two things one is the apps that's the most likely the other is maybe you have some weird power situation going on there's surges or something i don't think that's the, that's the case i don't i don't know because i did it at the store and it, the problem happened at yeah, the yeah good right so it's got to be an app yeah. so don't install any apps i mean really don't just do a factory reset and use the stock apps for a day or just charge it okay. see if it goes away then now you've got a bit of a task you're going to one by one reinstall your apps and each time put it on the wireless charger there's some and by the way when you find out what app it is tell the world because we don't want to use that app leo laporte the tech guy leo laporte the tech guy 8888 ask leo that's what we need is wireless chargers for our electric vehicles you just drive over a pad <laughs> i love wireless charging but it is inefficient and it's slow and uh, Apple has never released it for their phones, so there's a whole bunch of people who've never even considered it. But if you have a phone, as as you know, the Samsung Galaxy X7, a number of, uh, I think all the Samsung Galaxy phones, um, the does a Google phone wireless? No, I don't think it does. Just the idea that you can put it on a wireless charger and let it sit there, and the next morning, it does take a little longer to charge, but the next morning you get up and it's all charged. It's great. No plug-in or anything. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number moving along. Barbara in Simi Valley with a topical, a timely question. Hi, Barbara. Hi. Welcome. Hi, Leo. So my question is, um, I've always had an iPhone. Yeah. And should I stick with the iPhone or switch to the Samsung 7? <laughs> I'm not very techy. I usually, the most I do with the phone is text a little and take videos of my grandkids. Aw. Well, why would you even think of switching? I don't know. You hear me and others going, oh, this is a great phone. Oh. Because um, I heard that um, you can, I have 64 megs or whatever uh. it is, and you can get more. Um, what do you call it? You can buy an SD card and put it in the Galaxy S7. Yeah, right. It's That's a little weird, though, because you can't put... It's not like it just expands your memory. The Galaxy S7 comes with 32. That's the only choice. And then you can put in, uh, uh, I think, up to 200 gigabytes of additional storage. But it doesn't appear as uh, it, the same as the main drive. So, like, you can you put data on it. But for pictures, for videos, for audiobooks... That's what I put on it. Uh, podcasts, uh, music, all of that can go on the SD card. So it means that the main memory, the 32 gigs, is enough for the, your apps and your, you know, your kind of your operating system. And then you have all this extra space. But it isn't, you know, you can get a larger iPhone. You can go up to 128 gigs on the iPhone now. Mm -hmm. So okay. if it's time for a new phone, you might consider just getting more storage. Are you running out of space on your iPhone? Well, right now, the old one has 16. That's uh, not enough, and it makes me mad that Apple even sold you that phone. And now <laughs> I have, I would have 64. 64 is going to be plenty. What you have to do, you know, what we all need to do is take advantage of Apple's capability to, for instance, back up photos and store smaller images. What happens mostly is people fill them up with pictures and videos, right? You take a lot of pictures right. of the grandkids and the videos, yeah, and pretty soon right. you filled up the phone. Yeah. Apple now has this iCloud photo drive. If you just a switch in the settings, you turn that on, it automatically uploads your photos to, and you can do this, by the way, with other companies too. Google does this for free. Mm -hmm. uh, Flickr, uh, Facebook, a lot of other companies. I would use a couple. That way you've got two different places your pictures are saved. So you're really never at risk of losing them. And then it moves them off of your phone so you have more room for more pictures. Mm -hmm. So I don't, to be honest, I don't want you to upgrade to the S7 only because you're comfortable with the iPhone now, right? It does everything you want it to do, right? Yeah, actually it does. But, and the other thing is somebody was saying about there's a learning curve that... It's oh, yeah. Different. It's very different. You would be frustrated initially. Okay. I, you know, 
personally prefer the S7 by a long shot. But I do things with my phone that you probably won't do. I run a lot of other software. This my smartphone is really a comp is a full bore computer for me. It's almost my main computing device. So I'm uh, doing a lot of stuff you probably don't want to do. And the thing is, you already know the iPhone does everything you want it to do. You're happy with it. Yeah. That's why people still buy iPhones because <laughs> why change? Yeah. So I'd and say now I would have 64. 64 is so much more than what you've got now, right? Yeah, it's four times more. Yeah. And so you've managed with a ridiculously small amount of storage. Apple should never have sold a phone with 16 gigs. The only reason they even have that phone is so they can announce a low price. Mm -hmm. Right? Because nobody right. should buy that phone. Maybe maybe the most primitive users, uh, you know, people who are never going to add applications, never going to take pictures, well, then that's fine. But anybody who's going to put anything on their phone, they're going to run out of space way too quickly. So you'll like 64. I think that that I think you're going to thank me and you're say, "Oh, I'm glad it didn't change." Okay, just stick with the iPhone. Stick with the iPhone, Barbara. Okay, thank you very Thanks much. Thanks for the call. You know, you're, you're great. I Bye -bye. appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, I am not a huge iPhone fan by any means. I feel like Apple's a little bit behind. Okay, a lot behind. They haven't updated. Essentially, they haven't updated the user interface since it came out in 2007. Oh, they did. They added uh, folders a few years ago, and now they have 3D Touch. But there's, it's severely limited. And, uh, and I feel like Apple's software is not as great as it ought to be. But I am a different, I have different needs. And, uh, and you really have to choose the phone that's right for you. And in, in your case, Barbara, I think the iPhone is perfect for you. Perfect for you. And I, you know... All other things being equal, I would say the S7 is the best phone on the market right now. I, the Galaxy S7, unbelievable phone. But it's not right for everyone, by any means. Our website is techilabs.com. I encourage you to go there if you hear something on the show and you say, oh, i got to write that down or I want to know more. It's all there. We have our pick of the week, our tip of the week. And, of course, every show, audio and video afterwards, so that if you missed a show, you can catch up. The answers to every question, we divide it up by show, by hour, and even by question. And then there's a comment section in there, which uh, it, it, it's really a lifesaver. If you've been finding yourself yelling at the radio, and I know sometimes I say controversial things like, here's one. Objectively, the Galaxy S7 phone is, is 10 times better than any iPhone on the market. Now, if that made you yell, go to the website, techilabs.com, and tell me so in the, com in the comment section. You should have told Barbara to do this. That's fine. This, the site is free. There's no sign-up. And I want it to be a resource for everybody and, and everybody's opinion. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More of your calls coming up right after this. Ryan in Pittsburgh, PA, you're next. Hi, Ryan. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Welcome. Oh, man, thank you so much. I, I've come talking to Yoda. <laughs> talking to me, you are. Well, what can I do for you there, Obi-Wan? <laughs> I'm a long-time listener. I've been watching you since your ZD days and screensaver oh, days. And thank you. I, I, I can't say I appreciate you. Oh, you're so kind. Thank you so much. I appreciate your appreciation. Oh, no worries. So I'll tell you what, I do a lot of volunteer work in my son's school and also with uh, my church. And I, I, so I've been doing computer work for, I don't know, 20 plus years. And I've come into something that's kind of interesting. I figured you got to help it. All right. So the, the places that I work with, they have a couple of HP C200 Pro towers. And I got a call from them, you know, early this week and they said, I'm trying to. I'm trying to get through it. We're getting a lot of cutting out. Are you on a cell phone? Are you on a cell phone, Ron? Because it, Ryan, because it's cutting in and out a lot. Let's look. At this. Let me tell you. Get closer to the tower. <laughs> I can only hear every third word. Um, Is that any better? Yeah, that's better. Go ahead. All righty. So one of these towers just came up with a black screen one day, uh -huh. and uh, the lady who was using it said, like, boy, it sounds like the power supply is, you know, like a jet engine trying to take off. Uh -oh. So I thought maybe I'd have a problem with the power supply. So, you know, they have a couple of them there, so I swapped out the power supply with another, you know, known working one. Absolutely nothing. So then I'm thinking it's got to uh -oh. be the grab a third-party video card, um, nothing. Um, Actually pulled the CMOS, pulled out all the uh, pulled the battery on that, pulled out all the other USB peripherals. I got I got video on it on a add-on video card once, 
or once or twice, and then ever since then, nothing. Wow. So I'm, I'm stumped. And you want me to help? <laughs> so, so when you turn it on, you get nothing. You don't. Do you get any sound? Do fans come on? Does anything happen? Yeah, I mean, you can hear the power supply running, and after about thirty seconds, it sounds like a jet engine taking off. That's fans, right? Yep. Uh, so I'm not sure why the fans are spinning up, but you never see anything on the screen, and this is even though you've swapped out every bit of the video chain. Sir. I think you got a bad motherboard, and I don't. I, I, it's very hard for me to know exactly what's wrong from a distance. Uh, but you did what is kind of fundamental for troubleshooting, which is to narrow it down, right? And you do the easy stuff first. So if you turn on a machine and you see nothing on the screen, you check the cables. Make sure the screen's turned on. Make sure there's power going to the screen. Uh, and then you say, well, if that's all there. Let's swap out the cables. So you swap out the cables. Still not working. You try somebody else's monitor. Still not working. Now you think it's a video card. So... Maybe you attach to motherboard video if you have a separate channel that you can try. Uh, and it still doesn't work. Then you've done all that. So now we know it's not the monitor, cable, power, video card. It must be something worse. Now, with your ears, you're verifying that there is power going to the computer. Because that's where you maybe suspect the power supply. And it could be the power supply is working, but it's too low-powered to power up the motherboard. Uh, I would inspect the inside. These are tower cases. You should make sure that all cables are attached properly, all the boards are seated properly. And you might also be listening for postcodes. Because you're not hearing beeps coming out of the machine, that's when the machine is complaining. This new machine we built, I love it because it's got a little LED readout right on the motherboard. You have to open the case to look at it. But instead of beeps, we call them postcodes. Post stands for power on self-test. And if a machine cannot get to the point where it can display on the screen to tell you what's wrong, it will beep at you. This is the most primitive way it can communicate with you. And you can look in the motherboard manual or the computer manual and see what three short and two long beeps mean. And that'll give you some idea. RAM's not is missing, or it's not seated, or I don't have enough RAM, or I don't have enough power, or whatever. There are a lot of postcodes. We have a hundred different postcodes on this machine that I just built. And if it gets stuck at 38, I can open the manual and say, well, what's 38? And that'll help you figure out what's wrong. But you're not even hearing beeps. You're just hearing the thing come on, the fans come on, go to 100% immediately. That makes me nervous. Uh, and you're not seeing anything on the screen. I, you know, I have to, at this point, it could be maybe that the power supply is underpowered. You know, if something goes wrong with the power supply, maybe it's giving you, you know, 50 watts instead of 250 watts. Maybe that would be enough to get the fans going, but not anything more. The fact that they're at 100%, though, eh, worries me a little bit. You know, we know it's not the operating system or the hard drive. Maybe RAM has come unseated. If you didn't have any RAM at all, but then you'd get post codes. You'd get beeps or something. Um, it's getting. It sounds like it's getting past the power on self-test. It just can't display. It sounds like, frankly, the motherboard. Um, and and for that, you know, there's really no f cure except replacing it, RMA it, and sending it back to uh, to HP. It's the best I can do for you at a distance, Ryan. But I'm glad you listened. Thank you. Appreciate it. Victoria in Corvallis, Oregon. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Victoria. Hi, Leo. Yay, it's my turn. Yay, finally, after all this time. That's okay. That's okay. You're very Listen. patient. Thank you. Um, I'm a longtime listener. I'm a first-time caller. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank you for leading the way in showing the true diversity of the tech community through your shows on TWIT TV. Thank you. Yes. And I've got a tiny bit of a problem, and I just want to make sure that I'm going in the right direction. Okay. Okay, I've got a late 09 iMac, um, which is running wonderfully. It's updated to El Capitan 10.11.3. It's, it's a great little computer, no problems there. However, about three weeks ago, I noticed that I somehow got ransomware on <sighs> my computer. Wait a minute, I thought you said it was a Mac. I know, that's, yeah. Yeah. Wait a minute. There's only one ransomware I know of. 
And you shouldn't have been bit by it. It came from downloading a BitTorrent client called Transmission on a particular day. Did you download Transmission? Well, I did not, and that's why I was kind of surprised. Yeah. Um, they, they, I, literally, there is no other ransomware. How do you know you got ransomware? Well, because I listened to you. Um, <laughs> Don't blame me. <laughs> okay. Well, no, no. I didn't give you a ransom. So, so no. what is the symptom that you're seeing? Well, I'll tell you. Um, I've got my my little iMac set up to open to the Apple website, and I was doing that one day because I was looking for something, and I clicked on a link, and it automatically went to a screen that said, "Your computer is infected." Right. That's not ransomware. The good news is oh. that's just a spurious pop-up. See, I can do that with any website. Okay. If as and so and I've seen these myself on my own Mac. Uh, okay. If you go to a website that is either malicious or more likely is not malicious but is hacked, the uh -huh. website might be a normal website where you get information. This was I went to a tech news site, not a big one, but a, but one that I've seen before. And I got exactly that pop-up. Now, that doesn't mean you're infected. In fact, you're not because you're on a Mac. Oh, good. Yeah. All it means is that that website is infected and popped up a screen to scare you. Okay. So what I did was I did a little reading because I'm an Apple fan girl and I've got everything. <laughs> you know, the iMac. Good. Phone, all of it. But, but I just want to say this. There's nothing more to say. Leave the website. You're done. There's no infection. You're fine. But why do I still get all of these pop-ups? I am Don't go to that website anymore. Clear your cache if you're using Safari. Reset it. There is nothing on your machine, I can promise you. That is just a pop-up. Now, maybe your homepage has been hijacked. We'll talk about that when we get back. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 88, 88 Ask Leo. Last little bit of the show. Man, it goes fast. Um, let's go to Bob in San Diego. Hey, Bob, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. How are you? Great, Bob. How you doing? Very well. I got to tell you, I accidentally deleted one of my notes on my iPhone. And what was the note? All my battery numbers for all the devices I have. So I <laughs> was going to have to open them up to see what battery oh, was needed. Oh, man. Of course, that's the one note you delete, not the one that says, you know, don't forget to buy Valentine cards. Right. So I, I called Apple up because I've I, I got backups on my computer and backups in iCloud. <clears throat> so we went to a backup of uh, January because I knew it would be there. It's been there for a long time anyway. And uh, we backed it up. And what happened from the backup was that uh, I prior to the backup, I had two categories of notes on my phone. One was on iCloud. One was on iPhone. How that happened, I don't know because when I originally got an iPhone four, three, four years ago, my we moved my information from my Palm Trio, and I had about 300 notes there, and somehow they got separated. I don't know why, but in the meantime, so, but then all of a sudden what happened one day was I was looking for a specific note that I had just done about a week before. Well, they said, look in your emails, and so there were three below notes and on the iCloud notes in the phone. There's three email addresses that have notes in them, too, and I said, what's that about? Well, I moved all of them into uh, iCloud. Well, when this thing came back, all of a sudden I've got 54 notes that are in one of my email addresses. And they say the only way I could do it is one by one, which I did in the past when I had the three email addresses with notes. Okay. And your and question so is? <laughs> my, my, my question is, is there any way of moving bulk notes, like 54 notes in one email address, into either iCloud or iPhone? You know, you just have to copy and paste. I don't even know why they're in there. Although, uh... Uh, there's all the notes in one email. In one email address. address. So there's about 50 notes. 50 yeah, I don't, I'm not sure I really email. understand the question. I, I think you just have to copy and paste. I don't know of a automated way to do that. Maybe somebody in the chat room does. That's, uh, I have no idea what's, what's going on there. <laughs> uh, 8888 Ask Leo. That's the phone number. If you have an idea... Tell you what, let me take a break while you're thinking about it, and uh, and uh, I will uh, I will read the chat room and see if they can come up with an answer for you. Meanwhile, let's talk about backup, <laughs> since that seems to be the topic of the day. Why aren't people backing up? Too late to call me. Too late to call me if you haven't backed up. Disasters happen. You know, hard drives fail, fires happen. 
uh, all sorts of messes happen. And uh, and I think a lot of times people go, well, I feel lucky because somehow accidentally I emailed myself a note. Carbonite. Can I get just please, 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 please sign up for Carbonite today. You don't have to do it. Uh, just do the free trial. You don't have to pay for it. Go to Carbonite, C-A-R-B-O-N-I-T dot com. For business, for home, for Mac, for PC, you install it and then you forget it. You pay once a year. It's like less, it starts at less than five bucks a month for everything on a PC. Everything. You know, you back up as much as you need to. And it's automatic. You change a file instantly, it's backed up. And it's not backed up next to your computer where it could get stolen or burnt or destroyed in a, in a, in a catastrophe. It's up there in the Carbonite cloud enjoying a, a beautiful climate controlled vacation. Carbonite even backs up the backups and distributes them. So you're completely safe. And by the way, yes, private, because it's encrypted, not only on the way to Carbonite, but in place on the Carbonite server. So there's no reason not to get Carbonite. And I can think of a lot of reasons you'll be sorry if you don't. Go to Carbonite.com. Use my name, Leo. That'll give you two months free when you decide to buy. But this is, again, do the free trial with my name, Leo. They also are offering now, for a limited time, 30% off. So, I mean, really, why wouldn't you do this now? Don't be calling me next week saying I lost my data. Carbonite. you got to back it up to get it back. So do it right with Carbonite. I'm out of calls. Did you, did you, not, did you turn off the phone? <laughs> All right. This has never happened. Oh, here's one. <laughs> <laughs> you thought I would take longer on that call, didn't you? I did. <laughs> Um, well, I don't need calls. I can talk about anything. Believe me. Uh, the interesting news from the FBI Apple story now. The FBI is now sending out memos to law enforcement all over the country saying, oh, hey, you got some iPhones you can't get into? We know how now. We'll help you unlock them. So we were we were wondering, is the FBI going to share the information with Apple about it? Because they, they, remember, uh, FBI told Apple... And the judge this week, never mind. Never mind. You know that thing where we got you to order Apple to unlock the phone? Never mind. We figured it out. So they dropped it. They dropped it last this week, this past week. Apple's saying, um, you're going to tell us how you crack our phone, what security flaw you found? Because it's clearly, a, it is, it would have to be a security flaw in the phone. And the FBI has remained mum. And well, I think we got the answer because... According to BuzzFeed, the FBI is sending an advisory to local authorities. They sent it out on Friday saying, eh, you want some, quote, technical assistance, end quote, with your locked iPhone? Uh, we can help you. Now, if they, the problem is if they tell Apple how they did it, then Apple's just going to uh, fix it. <laughs> and that, uh, that hole will be uh, patched up. So, uh, Clearly, the FBI has decided, well, this is such a boon for law enforcement. We're just going to keep it mum. Here's the problem with that. How do we know the FBI are the only people who know this? Are there others? Are there hackers out there who have figured this out? Are these hackers going to now use this to do things like put malware on our phone? You heard our last caller's concern about ransomware. On her Macintosh. Well, the good news is there's no ransomware avail uh, out there on the Macintosh. Wouldn't it be ironic if all of a sudden there were ransomware on your iPhone because the FBI found a flaw and didn't it, it reveal it to Apple? It's highly unethical. I, I understand the conundrum the FBI has. It's highly unethical, considered highly unethical, to find a security flaw and not disclose it to the company so they can fix it. That's widely agreed upon in the tech community be a bad thing. And that's what the FBI apparently has decided to do. Now, if nobody ever figures this out, well, no harm, no foul. The FBI's got a secret back door and nobody else does. How long do you think that situation will last? FBI won't tell us where they found this flaw. Is it a company that found it? Is it uh, a secret website? How do we know what they know and how do they... Figure it out? And are they telling anybody? No. And uh, they won't tell anybody where they got it, what the flaw is, 
And they're now going around to law enforcement saying, hey, we can crack the phone. Don't worry about it. Nothing to fear here. This really puts in, in to highlight, I think, the real dilemma we have. It's not really whether your stuff is private. That's kind of not the issue, is it? Uh, you know, law enforcement, and we've, we've all agreed this is our Constitution. This is right. Law enforcement, under certain very specific circumstances, can get a search warrant for anything you've got. Except your brain. It's the only thing the courts have protected. They can't search in your brain. They can't force you to reveal stuff that would incriminate you. That's the Fifth Amendment. But anything else, they could search your home. They could search that safe in your basement. Anything else they can search if they have a warrant. Except, turns out, these smartphones are encrypted and they haven't been able to search them. And I agree. I think I agree with law enforcement that, that you know, that's not covered in the Constitution. And, you know, we need to figure something out. But that's not really the issue, is it? A, bad guys know how to do this because in, strong encryption is, is out there. It's easy to do. Any coder can write you an encryption program. And there's, plenty, there's 70 countries that make software that, not, not the country, but their software comes from 70 different countries that you can use to do it. So a bad guy can get good, strong encryption. The problem is that if there is a flaw, security hole, in the Apple iPhone, and the FBI knows about it but doesn't reveal it, and then a bad guy gets it, it's not privacy. <laughs> Our phones could be completely destroyed, could be damaged, ransomware, all sorts of issues. There, and, and that's the real issue, that it fosters crime. In the process of solving crimes, they're fostering crimes. This is a tough one. I don't know where you stand on it, but I'd love to hear from you. You can go to the website, techguylabs.com, leave your comments, or we'll talk about it next week. Techguylabs.com is the website. Thanks so much to Nathan Staten, our musical director, to Kim Schaffer, our phone ranger, to all of you who called and all of you who listened. Couldn't do the show without you. I'm Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. Have a great Geek Week. See you next time. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, it's just the tip of the iceberg. We do nearly 30 shows on the Netcast Network. It's called TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. You even get your daily dose of tech news with Tech News Today. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon. This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you next time.